Welcome everybody to day two of the conference. So um, just to remind you, um, there are two tracks for today. One is the R track, which is always going to be in this room. The other is the Python track, which is if you head to the coffee station and just keep walking until you come to not the first room, but the second room. And then all the Python talks are there. You should have the program for both sessions and you'll obviously choose whichever you, you want to do it and whenever you want to do. Uh, so that's kind of announcement one. Announcement two is that um, the NHSR community is supporting the R Girls project, which is about introducing R into schools for girls aged 11 to 16. Uh, so there will be a talk about that later from the, uh, the, the headmistress from the school is coming. So, so behave yourselves, please. Okay. Um, and, and there are some promotional mugs uh, if you're interested in, in purchasing those. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first keynote speaker, and that's Andy, please. So, Andy, thank you very much. Buying those drinks last night paid off. Thanks for clapping. Uh, um, thank you very much. My name is Andy Olowski. I'm a health economist. I'm the director of the Health Economics Unit because, as you know, health economists have no imagination when they're naming their teams. Uh, I'm the president of AFA, and I'm talking on behalf of AFA today, so AFA, the Association of Professional Healthcare Analysts. I also sit on the council of the HFMA. I lecture at Imperial, and I'm doing a PhD in medical statistics. Normally, at the beginning of a talk, I would then say I'm a massive nerd. But today, I think I'm in most probably very good company, and, uh, um, and that doesn't really wash with you guys. But I'm going to kind of cover some of the key things that AFA are doing as we kind of move forward um, over you know, what we've done last year and what we're continuing to doing, and how AFA is working with NHSR on some of the kind of big programs going forwards. So it's been an amazing uh, um, year for us in analytics. So coming off of the back of COVID, where I think that uh, all of us found a renewed uh, um, um, interest in our work, a profound new kind of uh, respect for some of the stuff we do. We've had nine data and analytics policies and strategies launched this financial year alone. Nine strategies, and if you caught Jess Morley's talk yesterday, she has an amazing blog uh, on, on, on the kind of the breakdown of all of those nine data and analytics strategies that profoundly affect all of our jobs. So if you haven't read it, you need to make sure that you understand those things, and Jess Morley has a blog around that. So throughout those nine uh, uh, um, um, kind of strategies, it comes out that we have a vital role to play in the NHS. And Simon Stevens said in the middle of COVID, what a wonderful you know, uh, uh, work we were doing when he spoke at the Midlands and Lancashire CSU uh, meeting. Amanda Pritchard says, we save as many lives as a good anaesthetist I'm not sure how many lives a bad anaesthetist saves, maybe they don't. Uh, 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 um, and we have Tim Ferriss, um, Head of Transformation, saying that we, data and analysts, uh, um, um, play a vital role in recovery and in addressing inequalities. So a huge amount rides on our shoulders. So I'm not sure if we're being set up for a fall, but they need to blame someone. But so a really exciting time and a key bit around what we do, be you data engineer, data scientist, econometrician, uh, um, analyst, how we're going about our work is about improving the decisions that our system leaders and decision makers have to make. However we do the maths, however we solve those problems, it's about making sure that they have the best opportunity and make the best decisions from the data and the insights that you guys can provide. So, of those data strategies that, that talk about our contribution, one, the Gold Acre Review that Jess did talk about yesterday, mentions grassroots organisations. And in that, they mentioned the wonderful work that NHSR uh, are doing and by name, and they also mentioned the work that AFA was doing by name. And they talked about you know, how these grassroots organisations work together throughout COVID um, um, and for the response, but also will continue to work together going forwards. He calls for funding to support NHSR. How much funding does NHS England give NHSR community? Anyone have a hazard, a guess? That's right, none. So from the review, we get no money to support us from the centre to be able to move forward. AFA also receive no money from the centre to support this. So from the review that said how to bake in analytics, to drive analytics in the future, to make all of this difference, and there's very little support 
that isn't provided, oh sorry, that is provided by the centre. All of this community is built by people like you turning up to events like this, the wonderful people who put this stuff together and fund it um, off, often from shoestring budgets. So there's a lack of support from the centre. The, the, the big conference that Goldacre said that we should have that would also help support this, conferences like this, again, aren't supported by the centre. We're having to do this ourselves. And there will be next year, I'm not sure if you knew, that the CSUs are all banding together to pay for an analytics conference that will be for NHS and public sector analysts by NHS and public sector analysts. And it'll be another festival where we'll be able to get together and hopefully we'll be able to bind in NHSR community and PyCom and all of those guys too. So no new funding for us. So all of this weight on our shoulders, no new funding to support you in your jobs and in your roles and your continued professional development. So one of the asks or one of the responses was that Analyst X community was going to help support us and be able to do this. Analyst X has had its funding cut. And so they have one person who works at Analyst X and the rest of it is voluntary. So there's no funding for that. The centers of excellence that were put on Futures NHS, the funding has been cut. So this was meant to be slightly more upbeat than this. Sorry, uh, um, but there's, um, but we're proposing, we're proposing some key bits. And so one of the key things that we're going to be doing is working together on a proposal. So AFA spends a lot of time talking about the professionalization of our, uh, of, of analysts. So this is the idea that we're recognized as scientists, as we're recognized as, uh, um, uh, as a, a different group besides admin and clerical. Admin and clerical do some amazing stuff. I think that the way that you do the specialization and the work that you do is very different. I'm old, so I didn't get to learn Bayes or machine learning and stuff like that. So I'm having to go back and do a PhD to learn R, which is why I have a vested interest in R now. So if anyone can help me with my competing risk analysis, I will pay you good money to help me get through this PhD. And, uh, um, but on, besides that, I want to, you know, a key bit is about your continued professional development so to make sure that you can get better at R or Python or the statistical tools of tomorrow. How can we get that, that professional development as we go forwards? So how can sessions like this offer CPD points? How can we ensure that you get the opportunities from your organizations to go and get CPD and to make sure that your time for training and learning is protected going forwards? like it says in the NHS constitution that you're you know, allowed to do. Next is around standardizing the tools. And we have some amazing tools, free tools like R, like Python, and uh, um, let's go around. But the great things that you guys create and share in the community, just like we did through COVID, just like you do every day, how can we continue to do that and not spend fortunes with um, organizations, or not, often not us, but uh, um, decision makers and system leaders spending tools on software or spending money on tools and software that doesn't count. Um, how can we analyze you know, the work that we do to see how we can best help all of these data and strategies saying that we're going to make this difference, but how are we going to make the difference? And so how are we going to be talking about you know, um, improving decision quality, how we're going to be talking about how we do the work and make sure that the work is the high standard that you'd expect. When I worked in hospitals, uh, um, in performance management, you know, sitting there, we were running and managing, you know, hundreds of million pounds organizations and been able to do this. Um, but um, no, Guys and Tommy's at the moment is a 2.4 billion pound organization and the performance management is done by analysts who are, are sitting there helping these guys make decisions. There are very few people in the private sector where analysts have that responsibility of managing huge organizations and helping performance manage and work with um, the system leaders behind that. This is no small task. But those of you who work on population health and clinical care, you're making decisions that will move resources and potentially change the outcome for an individual patient. Yeah, these are huge responsibilities that, that we have. We need the support and we need to see how best we can help when we're going forwards from that. And finally, the recognition for the work that we're doing. There's a whole load of exciting stuff that we guys are doing. Everyone's talking about how we can help. How are they saying and supporting us and giving the recognition for the work that you are doing going forwards? So we are working together. 
And so um, we worked with Ben Goldacre and as we kind of asked NHS England what they were going to do for the response to the Goldacre review, uh, um, um, we wrote a couple of articles that went into HSJ and are also available on AFA's website. Of, of, we've coined the phrase, the Goldacre gap. There were things that they commissioned the report and the review from Goldacre, there's a whole load of stuff they haven't done and haven't done to support us. So there are these gaps that we're now trying to close. And a lot of it is about funding NHSR community. How can you guys get more support to do this? How can you build and grow the community in the way that you guys want to do it, not in the way that somebody else wants to do it and how we can move forward with uh, um, you know, those different steps and those projects. So we had a meeting and the wonderful uh, um, Craig Shenton and Chris Bealey were there uh, um, to help represent the organizations. If you have some great ideas of what you would like funded to take forward to represent your community, please let me know and I'll share my details and around round um, till lunch today. But we're building a portfolio of asks that come from NHSR, it comes from Python, it comes from AFA about supporting analytics as we move forward over the next uh, um, um, year or two. These come cover training, it covers a, a library of, you know, an open library of all of kind of the great work that we're doing. It covers CPD and how we can make sure that events like this have that, that support kind of going forwards. We're also trying to work and lobbying to make sure that analysts throughout the NHS have those opportunities to kind of go forwards. So, hopefully today you get a great chance and everybody else is more upbeat than my miserable talk about how we're not getting enough money. But uh, hopefully today you'll be able to sit down and chat. It will stimulate some of the ideas that you would want to take forward if we can go and get the funding. Then it's my job working with people like Ben Goldacre, working with Ronnie uh, um, to go round and we will rattle the tin, not just at NHS England, the Department of Health, but there are wonderful people at, um, um, in other places in the government where they've got funding to support analytics, AI, machine learning, uh, um, R, and all of these open things. Sadly, the timing isn't great now as uh, um, there's a huge contraction and they have to find 60 billion pounds, but we've got the ask as we go forwards. So if any of you are sitting here today thinking, wouldn't it be brilliant if NHSR could do this and if we could add this to the portfolio, please let me know and we will do our best to help make sure that that happens. So have a fantastic day. Enjoy sunny Birmingham uh, and, and the best you can. And, uh, um, and don't fall for the, the, the snake-hipped python stealer who's trying to drag you to the other room uh, um, as you're kind of coming across. Uh, and certainly for um, some of the wonderful presentations we have tomorrow, except for David's talk. David, sorry, has a great talk at Python uh, later on. But everybody else, stay here uh, 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 as we go forward. So a huge thank you. Enjoy the day. And uh, I look forward to catching up with you over um, the, this morning. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andy. That's wonderful. Um, and yeah, let's keep that conversation going through the day. Next up, I'd like to welcome back to the stand, Cara, um, to give us a, a lovely aesthetic introduction to the morning as well. Thank you. That's a word of confidence there before I even started, but um, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just get myself. Oops. There we go. So. Okay, good to switch over to my slides. Thank you very much. Um, I said this yesterday, but I'll say it again today. It's a huge privilege for me to be here, and it's been wonderful meeting some of you lovely people that I've interacted with um, online, some of you that I hadn't met before. Um, and if yesterday is anything to go by, we're in for a real treat today of just finding out amazing ways that you're using R to improve life within the NHS and for the patients. And as a patient, I would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you for um, the work that you're doing. Um, so I'm talking to you this morning about colour schemes for your plots. Um, I like a good punny um, title if I can come up with one. Um, I'm Cara Thompson um, and I'm a freelance data consultant specialising in enhanced um, reproducible reports, uh, reproducible outputs and data viz. And what I mean by that is getting you very easily from your data to something that looks nice and polished. Um, saving you some time in the process, but also helping your end users engage well with the outcomes of what you've been looking at. Um, the thing that drives me in all of this is maximising the impact of other people's expertise. There's so much expertise in this room and it's just been wonderful seeing the way that you're showcasing it here and inspiring each other um, with what you can do with R. 
Um, and today I'm going to give you five tips for creating and applying bespoke colour schemes to your plots. Similar to yesterday, it's going to be quite a visual talk um, and a bit of a whirlwind, but all the code um, and what, all the slides are available on my website at the link at the bottom, and I'll make sure that I link it from the NHS site as well. Um, but before I give you these five tips, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and please suspend all disbelief um, and follow me in an adventure about what the Palmer Penguins got up to last weekend. Um, last weekend, the Palmer Penguins decided that they would run a baking competition. Um, and they decided that they would pit the species against each other um, and choose different conditions to work in. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to watch with me this episode of The Great Penguin Bake Off, um, and we're going to try and plot our way through it. So the penguins went on a bit of an adventure, um, and I'm just going to steal the theme that we created in our presentation yesterday. If you weren't here yesterday, you can catch up with that again at the link um, on the slides. So they went on a bit of an adventure. They had different conditions in which they were baking. Um, some of them were given underripe bananas, some of them were given ripe bananas, and some of them were given overripe bananas. Now, I haven't added a legend here, but you can probably guess which species was given what. Um, those of you who've seen my talks before um, might think, here she goes again. Yes, but actually I've taken it a little bit further this time around. They were allowed to go on, on a retreat to plan their bakes and they chose different locations. So some of them went on a city break in Paris, the others went to the countryside, and the other group decided that they would go on a ski resort. They were allowed to invite a different mentor along with them. So we've got Paul Hollywood, Prue Leaf, and Mary Berry, blast from the past. Um, a goodie uh, to have on your side, I think, if you're going to try and bake anything. Um, and they were allowed to choose a different type of snack that they could have between their bakes. Um, some of them chose a tin of sardines, we've got some sushi, and we've got some fish and chips in the mix um, as well. And finally, the Adeli penguins, they were not sure about this on the right banana business, so they decided that they would try and vary the amount of banana in their mix. Um, and again, you can try and figure out which ones you think chose to add more banana to their mix. Um, now, before you think I've totally lost the plot, pun absolutely intended, um, that is not the case. Um, all I'm trying to do here is illustrate the first of my five tips, which is to try and use colour purposefully. Um, so using colour purposefully, it's not about making it a guessing game, it's about making it easier for the readers to remember what is what. Once you've clocked that the fish and chips are the orange and yellow bar, you don't really need to look at the legend again, you will remember that as you look through the rest of the plots. Um, so if at all possible, Try to do this in your own context. Now you're probably thinking, I'm not actually doing research about baking penguins. Uh, probably that's a good thing. Um, so let me give you an example from the real world. Um, I've been working on a project with some clients in academia who had looked at video ratings as to how trustworthy they were based on whether they were semi-automated, fully automated, or human-made. If you Google images of artificial intelligence, you often find a kind of bluey, gr bluey gray background for the machine-y type stuff, and then a pinky orange thing to do with a human brain somewhere. So I went with that, and if nothing else, it gave me a bit of a chuckle, um, thinking about hopefully the plot's not being evil and twisted, um, but us getting something useful out of it. I also did this yesterday in the themes plot. Um, here's what we had from the tooth growth data set, which is one of the inbuilt data sets that you find in R that you can use to just make some crazy plots. Um, as the, the drug dose or the amount of vitamin C increases, um, the colour gets darker. And that's quite a nice way of encoding that as well um, for, for your readers. Um, and as I said, it's not about guessing, but if I show you this plot without really thinking about it, you can see immediately that the green bananas did not fare well in the yumminess uh, rating, which is along the y-axis. Um, so it's all about making it easy for you to extract information from, from the plots. Um, tip number two, let others help you. I'm going to let you on a secret here. I find picking colours actually quite tricky. Um, but thankfully, there are others who can help. Um, I think we all like to um, talk about others needing to rely on experts where they need input from experts. And I think we can fall into the trap of thinking that we know how to do everything. We don't. There are people who are much better at colours than we are. And so let's go and get some help from them. You might have some department brand guidelines that you can fall back on, in which case, that's great. Go and use those. Uh, my favourite thing to do is start from a photo and use something like imagecolorpicker.com to pick out specific colours from it. If you like the look of the photo, you're probably going to find some colours within that that will work quite well together. Here are the photos that I used to create our Palmer Penguins adventure. Um, and here's a plot that I made recently using data from the Bake Off. Not that I'm obsessed with the Bake Off at all, but I told the tech guys that there would be a fun plot for them to see. This is entirely made in R um, and the colour palette comes from Prue's shirt. Um, I just thought if a fashion designer has gone to the trouble of making a shirt that looks nice, why not try and reuse some of those colours um, in a plot? 
Here we've got the color scheme that I was talking about earlier for the artificial intelligence stuff and the, the human brain, which comes from this image here. The bananas, just a set of bananas, why not? Um, if you can go literal, go literal. Um, I also encourage you to take inspiration from art and data visualizations that you like. Um, I was recently at the Leon Morocco exhibition in Edinburgh and was absolutely fascinated by his use of color. And I'm still trying to figure out how I can try and emulate that um, in some data viz. So look around you, go to the art galleries um, if you have a chance to do that um, and try and learn from people who are experts at these things. The other thing you can do is Google whatever you like palette. I gave that a go yesterday. Turns out there is a Birmingham color palette. There we go, who knew that? Um, so you can use that, but if you Google, you know, sunflower palette or flamingos or whatever it is that you fancy, um, someone will have gone to the trouble of putting together a nice color scheme that you can then build on. Or you can start from the color wheel and read around how best to use it. So there's a tool um, that I'm gonna try and show you here um, called Paloton, which makes it easy. So um, you can plug in how many colors you need we're not that clear on that screen actually, but you can choose the, the number of colors that you want up here, um, and then you can grab the wheel and move it around. Um, and it turns out, if you make your colors slightly less spaced out, um, you end up with slightly nicer palettes to work with. Um, so worth a shot, quite a useful tool um, that I would encourage you to, to have a play around with. Tip number three, um, apply your colors using a named vector. This is one of these coding gotchas that you fall into if you're not careful. So um, let's have a look at a basic version of our banana penguins plot. Um, and here the easy fix, the quick fix, is to just plug your color values into scale color manual. Brilliant. There we go, we've got our colors in. Now, the trouble is, say you've gone on holiday and some keen bean in your department has decided to fix your data for you in your absence and say, oh, actually, the species should have been a factor and it should have been an ordered factor. I just fixed that for you. When you come back to keep your eyes on the plot, the um, dots are moving around in terms of the colors. What's going on here? Um, what's going on is that the order in which the color values are applied has changed. So it was applied previously alphabetically, and now it's being applied um, in terms of the order of the factor. The way to avoid that happening, because you do not want this to happen um, in your own projects, is to use a named vector, and then you plug that into your plot code at a later stage, and then however much your keen bean wants to reorder your factors, you're still fine. Everything is safe. Key advantages, you know the colors are applied to the right data points. You keep your color data pairings correct throughout your whole project. You can package it up as a default palette as well. Um, you can reuse colors in the text, um, and if, they, if you want to find out how to do that, um, have a look at the workshop that I did a couple of weeks ago um, for this conference online. Fourth tip is to check for accessibility, and that's really important. We want to make sure that the visualizations that we create are accessible to people, regardless of differences in visual perception. Um, I'm not an expert at this, but there are other people who are, so again, let's make use of that. There's a brilliant package called Colorblinder um, that was created um, for us within the R community that we can use to just check what our plots look like to people who have different types of visual color perception um, and also to see what it looks like if you print it in black and white, which I think is actually really useful for our context. So let's just um, call our banana plot back up. This is what it is here. And then all you need to do is um, call this line of code up here um, and it will give you a grid with how your plot looks to people who've got different types of visual perception. Um, I think the desaturated one is also really useful if you work in a context where people tend to print their stuff out in black and white, uh, because then you can see whether your plot still works um, for them as well. So have a look at that passage, package, it's actually really useful. And um, the easy way to get a palette that works like that is to go from darker colors to lighter colors, or from lighter colors to darker colors, whatever works for you. Make sure you've got a mix um, in that. If you choose them all the same kind of darkness, then obviously when you um, desaturate it, it's not gonna work. Um, a few helpful resources for doing that, uh, to find colors, you can use my color space, you just give it a color and you hit go and it gives you a palette that goes from a darker color to a lighter color, which is really good. Um, you can test your color palettes at this website and I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, and you can also test the contrast of your text against the color. So if you're using um, text boxes that have got a colored background, um, it's worth making sure that that all works um, as well. 
Final thing, make use of interpolation. Um, and this answers the question that we were chatting to, talking about yesterday with one of our colleagues. Um, what if you don't know how many colors you've got to use? And you want to create a consistent palette um, across your plot. One thing that you can do is create a vector that has more colors than you're gonna need and get R to pick between them to maximize distance. The trouble with that is that it just picks them literally in order that you've given, and it just tries to maximize it across the, the vector. So it'll pick number one, number five, and number nine. You don't always end up with the nicest color combinations if you do that. So instead, I would encourage you to pick two or three anchor colors and then let R interpolate between them. There are some really sophisticated ways of doing that that I'm not gonna cover just now, but the color ramp palette will do a good job for that. So um, here we have our plot, and we know that we need nine colors because I've modified the data and we've just given it green, blue, and purple at the top um, to see how we go on with that. Let's try and improve on that. Going back to this image, I've used image color picker, and then I used this um, palette checker here to pick out some image from this, and uh, we feed that in to our anchor colors. I fed in a kind of mustard yellow, a pink, and a purple, um, and we end up with this. This is just with three different colors, um, and here we've got it with nine colors. Again, probably quite difficult to see on this plot, but you can have a play around, and it's nice that it just creates the number of colors that you need and keeps it all fairly consistent. Last thing to say, there are only so many colors you can use in a plot, um, so try a different approach if you've got too many. Maybe you could facet your data, or you could try using different shapes. Um, I did that for um, exam analysis, where we looked at how candidates performed in different bits of the syllabus. There were too many bits of the syllabus to have colors, so we used a letter for the data points for that. Or you can use emoji, and I feel like this is an appropriate point to share the silliest plot I've ever created, um, all done in R using GG Animate, um, and you can use emojis for your data points. But, you know, who knows? Why not? There's so much more that we could talk about. Packaging up your colors for easy reuse, um, creating your own scale. Uh, we could use, you know, we could create a scale NHS demo color with the Birmingham palette if we wanted to. Uh, basing your dark text color on the central color in your plots, but we kind of have to talk about that um, some other time. So I'll just close off and remind you of these five tips. Use your colors purposefully, let others help you, apply color using a name vector, check for accessibility, and make use of color interpolation. Happy plotting. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Cara. Brilliant. Okay, uh, next up, I'd like to invite Milan. Hey, um, I'm Milan. I work at the Bennett Data Institute um, for Applied Data Science and um, I'm a researcher and data scientist, and it's really exciting to be here in person, see all your faces, because I've worked with some of the, uh, some of the people in the room for years and um, never seen them in real life. So that's really exciting to finally be here. And today, what I want to talk about is how we translated clinical rules from a Word document into reusable and modifiable code. Great. Um, I want to start with what we did and then how we did it and why we did it. We developed reusable and modifiable analytic code that replicates complex quality and outcomes framework rules for blood pressure monitoring, hypertension prevalence, and hypertension management in open safety. And I will talk a little bit more about what the QOF is um, and um, also about open safety. But I don't want this talk to be about QOF um, or necessarily just about open safely, but more about the concept of translating something from a Word document into reusable code. Um, first, because I don't assume that you all know what open safely and um, the quality and outcomes framework is, I want to introduce that to you guys. Um, but the main focus, I want to be on number two, translating clinical rules into code and um, at, at the end, I want to talk a little bit how we can monitor changes in what these rules represent by, uh, by month or by year or across different groups. What is Open Safely? Um, it's all really well documented and I don't have the time to explain everything, so here's just one slide. Um, Open Safely is a secure, secure analytics platform for electronic um, patient records built by our group on behalf of and it is England to deliver urgent academic and operational research. And crucially for this project, it allows us to um, develop complex clinical indicators 
and analyze them in, um, in, in near real time. Um, so that's open safely, um, or at least those bits that we need um, at the moment. And I'll go a little bit in the details um, um, later how we use open safely to do this. But first, what is the quality and outcome framework? Um, it was introduced in 2004 to improve the quality of care in general practice. And GPs are measured against um, indicators of good clinical care and receive financial incentives based on their achievement. Um, and these indicators of good clinical care are really well described in Word documents with lots of details. Um, and they're specified by NHS Digital and um, they're, they're quite good um, um, variables that are defined in concepts. But unfortunately, to us, um, we can only access the Word documents and we can't see the code that um, represents them. So what we thought we could do is um, translate these um, Word documents into reusable codes um, because, it, first of all, it's good um, to have that available and, if, um, um, and to do research with those um, variables that we created. Um, COF has a couple of domains, um, clinical, public health, and for this talk I picked um, two, the blood pressure monitoring um, um, indicator from the public health um, domain and the hypertension indicators from the clinical domain. And you can see how um, they are broken up um, into different indicators for blood pressure. We have only one and that's blood pressure monitoring. And we'll go into more um, of the details um, for blood pressure and hypertension is three. One is hypertension prevalence and then hypertension monitoring um, in two different age groups. So now, how did we do this? And why did we do this? Um, translating these clinical rules into code. Um, here's a workflow, and I will come back to this later, and so I won't explain everything. But you can see there's lots of Word docu um, documents and lots of pages um, represented at the very left of the slide. And what we did at the beginning is um, we um, uh, took the, the, the bits and pieces um, from these Word documents um, out. Is it, yeah. Um, and um, for example, um, code lists, um, it's really well described um, what codes, clinical codes, SNOMED codes to use to define the variables and how to define them. So first, we took all of that out. And in the next step, we combined everything and then um, wrote our analysis scripts in R or Python um, and um, then applied some uh, actions um, in our project YAML, which defines in which order we want to execute our study. Um, and there's a little um, bit that um, yesterday Ian um, described about re reusable and scripted actions, which we, which we would use in our project YAML. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this um, later. This was just to illustrate the workflow. So now this is how the blood pressure um, quaff indicator looks in the Word document. And um, I want to take this apart um, into very, very small units, because that's what we decided to do, is we didn't, didn't want to write, write one script for all of these rules. We wanted to define every single piece of information in here in an object and have multiple scripts that interact with each other so that people could um, um, take these variables that we created and um, apply them in their context. And maybe um, if you don't agree with the rules, you could do it, you choose a different cutoff, for example. Um, this gave me a lot of headaches um, because I'd never seen Quaff before and I'd never looked at these Word documents. Um, so what helped me to understand this is break it down into this flowchart um, that describes it a little bit easier, at least to me. And Essentially, what we have is a couple of rules um, that get applied and a, couple, a bit of logic um, where, depending whether the rule is met or not met, someone is rejected or passed on to the next rule or selected. 
And um, what, we're, what we're trying to do um, here is build, first build a denominator and then apply a numerator to the denominator. Um, a little bit about the clinical context here, otherwise I think most of the rest won't make a lot of sense. What this is trying to do, and I picked this because it is one of the simpler ones, um, this indicator um, represents the percentage of patients above 45 um, that had a pl blood pressure recording in the previous five years. And what the first rule does is it selects patient, um, well, it rejects patient um, below 45, and then it looks whether patients had a blood pressure reading in the previous five years. Um, and if yes, you get selected. If not, you get passed on to the next rule, rule number three, and um, maybe you declines your blood pressure to be monitored, in which case you get rejected, or maybe you've recently moved to GP practice, in which case um, you're also rejected. So that's how these rules work. Um, and as you can see, it, it's very detailed. All these blue bits and pieces are hyperlinks, and it's all really well described, but we don't have the code. So how did we do the code? Yeah. Um, I want to focus on only the first two rules because that's enough to describe the concept, how we, um, how we um, did the rules. Uh, and so the first thing um, I, I look for is um, the age variable, and that's just a patient characteristic that we need to extract. Then there's cutoffs, and that could be age, but it could also be your systolic blood pressure reading or, or things like that. And then we have clinical events, in this case, um, BPDAT, which is, um, I think, the date of your latest blood pressure reading. But it's, it's related to a clinical code list that describes which SNOMED codes um, are um, um, relevant for this particular variable. And that, that could be blood pressure, but that could also be a diagnosis or something else. And then we have dates and timeframes that um, tell us a little bit more about the context. Um, and I think only trying to look for these things and um, then figuring out how to combine these variables with the logic that is given to us um, is, for most cases, enough to represent um, these word documents in code. Um, what we did first is try to do a one-to-one -on -one, uh, one -one translation and then make it modifiable. And um, I think that was good because uh, making it modifiable and reusable and shareable and copy-pasteable across projects or other ways of sharing um, was tricky. Um, and uh, now I want to show you how we did this with open safety and open code lists. And here, the open code list screenshot is the code list that I was just referring to, it's all the blood pressure codes and um, the open safety screenshot is all the amazing functions that were given by open safety to do this. And you'll see some examples, but on the very right and on, on our website, um, you can have a look at all of these functions. And if you want to dive in deeper, you can dive in um, into the GitHub repository and see how they defined and what they actually do. So, um, H. Um, to get H um, within Open Safety, um, you use the function H as of. And one thing I should probably <coughs> point out is that we're trying to get the H as of an index date, and that's just our way of saying um, at the date at which this study is run. And this will become relevant later when I talk about whether we want to do this maybe yearly, monthly, or at a different time scale. And so what's important is we're looking at patients age of, age as of, at an index date, and you can ignore the last day of month and plus one. Um, that's trying to replicate exactly what's in the business rules, but it's not um, crucial to understand this um, translation. Then um, to define the cutoff value, we are taking the variable that we just defined and just um, apply the logic and we say, just pick patients above or equal um, 45. And um, that's our denominator rule number one, done. 
using the function patients satisfying this condition. Rule number two, we have clinical events and dates. So we somehow need to get that into our rule, um, into our code. And we're using patients with these clinical events. We specify the code list, BP codes, which was on the screen just earlier. Then we specify our time frame, and you can see the index date again. And we're saying index date um, minus five years. And just to remind you what this does, it's looking and it's creating a flag in, in, in our data, essentially, um, whether or not one of these blood pressure codes was in your records um, between this particular, like, in this particular time frame, which is um, rule number two. And again, um, like before, we're doing patients satisfying and then just throwing this variable and um, that's our rule number two defined. And at this point, if you, for example, just want rule number one or just rule number two, you could use just these rules. Um, so that's two very, very basic examples and it gets incredibly complex with some rules to do this. And we've done some of those rules and they're all um, on our GitHub and I'll share the links where and um, so now let's have a quick look at um, how we can um, look at um, the, the, the time periods um, of these results. Usually, as these results are published, is yearly by Initials um, Digital, and they just um, cover the time period from the beginning to the end of the financial year. Um, and that's always using one index date, but we can run this study many times and uh, uh, the errors are probably a bit confusing, but this is essentially run now monthly um, because maybe you need to know what's happening in between. Maybe a yearly interval isn't enough to, to answer your research question. Um, so that's possible and that's quite simple in, um, in, in Open Safely to change. All you have to do is define your range, your date range, and then say whether you want it by month or by year. Um, you can also do group buys if um, the, the population rate isn't enough for you. Um, and to do that, you can define your groups um, um, in, in a list, then define these variables and run a for loop to extract whichever groups are uh, relevant for you. And I didn't bring results because we're not done yet, but there'll be a paper. Um, but what you can do um, is check out everything that I run, have run so far every line that was executed and all the lines of code that ever been written by looking at our open safety jobs and click on yeah view logs to see everything that's been run. I wanted to end with this slide and bring it back because it describes everything I talked about today. Um, we defined reusable variable libraries that other people can use and we did this because we think the cross variables are great and good, well, well, well reviewed and might be um, um, good for other studies. Um, and maybe you can take these variables and manipulate them. And right now you need to copy paste them, but uh, in future there might be better ways of sharing variables across studies. And the last thing I wanted to point out is you see the, the R and the Python logo here, and that is because you can use R and Python, and although I use Py R exclusively for five years, um, mainly because that was the first community I was in touch with um, and was relevant in my research field, um, I've become a big fan of Python, and it's great to have both of these communities here at the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milan. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, it's great to see another example of what can be done with Open Safely. Um, and I, I think it's something that we'll all be looking at and going, oh, what can I do with that? Um, and see these examples and be able to draw from them. So uh, thank you very much. We haven't got any time for questions, unfortunately. So we're going to go straight on. And we've got Chris up next. And uh, he's going to talk to us about curves, I believe.
Good morning, everybody. Just bear with me two seconds while I set this up. Fantastic. Um, so, morning, everyone. Uh, so, my name's Chris. Um, one of the things I saw yesterday in some of the other talks was some people had QR codes um, to go directly to the slides. So, forgive my very hastily added QR code, but if that's helpful to anyone, uh, I'll leave it up for a minute so you can take you direct to the slides. You might get a better take on it from one of the side monitors. Um, so, yeah, as I said, my name is Chris Maney. Uh, I'm Deputy Director of Specialist Analytics at North Central London ICB. Um, I am a statistician, data scientist, analyst, depends who I'm talking to, I guess. Um, and I think the uh, definition of those things can be a little bit fluid. What I'm going to talk to you today uh, about is a subject that I'm kind of interested in. So I've done a lot of regression modeling over the years, um, and I realize that's not everybody's bag. So we'll do a quick slide on exactly what regression is. But what I'm talking to you about, and apologies for the bad meme, but it's, you've got to start with a meme, right? Um, is that sometimes we try and make really simple assumptions with the regression model, and they might not fit our data very well. So let's imagine, firstly, that you want to do a regression. Now, a regression here, you've got two variables. So we've got a y-axis, so that's the vertical axis, and we've got an x-axis, that's the horizontal one. So we're trying to predict y using x, basically, or explain y using x. Now, that kind of looks fairly simple from that take, yeah? Maybe we could just draw a line straight through it, and that would work. And it kind of does. And for any of you who can sort of hark back to uh, school maths, it's the equation of a straight line. So we've got... Um, an intercept, so the point at which we cross the y-axis, which is commonly no, uh, used, described as alpha in the notation. And we want to know for each unit of x, how far do we go up? How far up does our line go each time we increase x? And we refer to that as a coefficient here, so as a beta. So we've got a starting point and how many times we multiply x by something broadly. And then we've got some error on the end of it because we're never going to get it perfectly right. You can see all those data points don't line up on the line exactly, they're near about, and that distance is referred to as residual, so it's residual error. So if you plug some numbers into it on that particular chart, we've got an intercept of two, and for each unit of x, we're going up uh, one and a half units. So you can use that to predict data. Now, it's really nice if your data is really well behaved, but if it's not, then you start to get into some difficulty. So that's kind of similar to what we've just seen, but maybe the more eagle-eyed of you will see, it's kind of slightly more sigmoid in shape, slightly more of an S in shape. So if I fit a linear fit to that, kind of looks okay on first glance, but the closer you look, actually, it looks really like we're maybe over predict, sorry, we're, we're underfitting it here. Um, so we, our line is a lot lower than the majority of the data points there. And it's a bit debatable as to whether some of that's going on here as well. So really, it's not quite a linear relationship between our x and y there. So, so what other options have you got? Well, commonly, we tend to cut them into categories or bins. So here, I've cut it into three categories. So we've said um, where x is 0 to 50, uh, 50 to 150, or greater than 150. Now, it sort of makes sense when you don't plot it, because you think, oh, I can group them into bins. But as soon as you plot it, you'll see that actually what you end up fitting is the mean for each of these groups. And the mean is nowhere near some of those groups at various different points. So categorical is easy, but it's often not a very good fit or you sacrifice some of the power of your fit to do that. But what if we could draw something that was maybe a bit better fit? So this is referred to as a polynomial fit. And now I'm not gonna go into the definitions of polynomial because I'm not a strong enough mathematician to do that for you. But broadly, we can use functions on top of x here to do something a little fancier. So if you compare the three of them, I'm suggesting to you that the red line is probably where we want to go. So first of all, um, as I said, I'm not going to go into too much definition because I'll probably get it wrong. But broadly, what I'm talking about here is adding um, squares, cubes, etc., higher order powers of our x-axis. So we're fitting something like x and x squared and x cubed. And kind of magically, this fits together over the range of our data. And we can have different coefficients for the different uh, shapes of those. And that helps us describe that coefficient. 
Now, it doesn't mean a lot to you or I when I'm saying it like this, but when you fit that into your model and you fit x and x squared and suddenly it fits a lot better, it makes a lot more sense on the data you're working on. But there are some problems with it. So although we do get quite a good fit, they tend to go a little bit crazy at the end. So I don't know if you can see this chart on the right here. Uh, it's something referred to as Runge's phenomenon where you fix certain points. So you can see where these lines cross over. And in order to meet those fixed points, uh, the polynomials have to flex quite a lot. So they tend to get quite crazy at the edges of our ranges. So what if we could do something that's maybe a little bit more suitable? Let's take this polynomial idea, but try and get rid of that crazy part on the edges. So maybe if we could put a series of polynomials, if you can see on the plot to the left, if we fitted a series of them underneath, but we could boost some of them higher than others to support the fit of our line here. Then we can use something that we describe with the term spline. So imagine it back years ago before we had a computer aided design. If you were drawing plans for something on a massive piece of paper, how would you have drawn a smooth curve from one part to another? Well, how people used to do it was with a thing called a draftsman spline, which was a thin, flexible strip, often a piece of wood, and you would fix it in a few places. And then you could get your pencil and draw it over, but the tension in that strip held it to shape. Now, so curiosities aside, there's a mathematical version of this where you can apply a mathematical spline to things. And for those of you who like a definition, what I'm talking about here is a smooth piecewise polynomial. So you're sticking uh, polynomial terms together, one after the other, and you can draw a really complicated fit uh, really quite easily. And we fix these together at things that are referred to as knot points. So how smooth do you want to fit the data? Because that's always a, a question. So if you've got a big cloud of points and you draw a very smooth line through that, is that a good smooth fit or are you losing detail because you've drawn it too smooth? And there's a couple of ways to do that. So you can either put more knots in. So the chart on the left here, going from the, the sort of turquoise as the lowest number of knots at three. Then we've got 20, which is the yellow. It's not coming out quite so well there, but, and then 50, which is the red, which you can see bounces around a lot more because there's a lot more opportunity to, to flex. But you also apply a penalty, which smooths it down. Um, so that uh, is demonstrated on the right here. So with no penalty or a very low penalty applied, we've got the turquoise pattern. But we've also, as we apply an increasing penalty, you see it gets smoother and smoother. So the highest penalty on these is the red curve here. But what we actually do in order to fit these re in reality is we throw more knots in than we need and we use the penalty to pull it down so it doesn't get too crazy. Now that sounds all well and good, right? It sounds really complicated. It can be, but I can't do all the maths behind it, but there's a really handy R package for doing a lot of it. But just to clarify what it's doing for a second, before I was saying we were predicting Y using X for a regression. So all we're doing now is predicting Y using a function of X. So we've just wrapped something clever around X to change it a bit. And for those of you again who like the more mathsy definitions, this is an example taken from uh, Simon Wood's book, which is really a tour de force on how to use these, and it's the, the, the text to use. But what we've got here is this, this is a generalized linear model uh, take on it. So we're predicting something here with a series of different smooths. So you could put a different type of smoother on every variable. And this one at the end here, where we've got two terms in the smoother, Sometimes we have things called interactions um, when we're building regression models where we have variables that affect each other and in the presence of each other, the fit is moderated. Imagine you've got a paper plate and you uh, want to sort of pull it over the top of a, a balloon or something, you'd have to bend that, that plate. It's the same sort of idea here. So mathematically we're saying we've got two variables and maybe the combination of the two of them can flex and fit. Now it all sounds well and good, right? But how do you build that model? Well, there's a really, really good package that comes as part of base R, uh, which is called MGCV, Mixed GAM Computation Vehicle, which is a snappy title, right? Um, but again, this is Professor Simon Wood's book, um, the, the chap who I was talking about his book a second ago, it's his package and it's developed 
fantastically over the years, and it really is very simple to use. And for any of you who've ever used the smooth in ggplot, the GM smooth, one of the methods that it uses to smooth is this GAM under the hood. So it's kind of quite well integrated already. And a slight plug for my regression tutorial uh, later in, uh, in the month here, but very similar to any other regression model you might build in R, rather than wrapping it in LM for linear model or GLM, we simply wrap it in GAM. But the addition here is this S term. So we are wrapping X with this S and saying wrap a smoother around X. And you can choose all sorts of different smoothers. So as you get more and more complicated, you can get into things that do like uh, geographical smoothing and all sorts of things. So depending on your application, there's, there's loads of options. But the nice thing about it is that you don't have to estimate them all out of the, you know, out of the gate. The, um, the model mechanism estimates the smooth for you and it estimates the penalty. Now, you can control all of these things if you're a more advanced user. But it does a really, really good job just telling it to fit the model straight up because it makes a sensible choice on the number of knock points and the penalty for you and it estimates those. So you would then look at a model summary just like you would with the GLM. And, but the difference is rather than having a model coefficient here that you might interpret, sorry, I know this is a bit dense for those who don't do regression models, but normally you would get this out and you would look at, at the different coefficients and see which ones are predicting. But it tells you the approximate significance of the smooth term. So this then speaks to the use case. So if you're not so bothered about understanding exactly how each parameter fits at each point in the fit, then you're quite happy there, which is the case with most prediction models, to be honest. And if you're doing something like, um, let's say causal inference, where you want an adjustment set and you're not really bothered about the, the details of the adjustment set, you just want it to fit very well, then you're, you're happy there because you know that the smooth is significant and you don't really need to do too much more. And it's got all the regular things that, that um, other model functions have, so you can go and check, you can check the residual patterns, etc. Um, it's also got a handy checking function here. And the point of this checking function is to tell you whether you need to specify more knots, essentially. And uh, that's the key constraint. So if you find you fit this model and it doesn't work very well, you might need to add more knots. So finally, if I was going to fit a linear model to that data at the beginning, the sigmoidal thing, how does that compare to the GAM of the same thing? Just straight out of the box, you know, with no tuning. So there's a couple of different ways you could, well, there's a lot of different ways you can compare regression models, but here's two. Got an AN over there where I've got a significantly better model, essentially, fitting the GAM. Or for those of you who know what AIC is, it's a relative measure of how much information a model you loses. So my GAM here has a smaller AIC, so it loses less information, so it's a, it's a better model. So in summary, what I'm saying here is that sometimes when you're fitting regression models, um, you are lacking a bit of flexibility and you're making an assumption that you're doing a linear prediction of Y using X. But it might be a little bit more complicated than that. You might have a, a different relationship there. And actually, GAMs do a very good job of linear relationships as well. So they're actually quite a good default starter model that will flex to your data regardless of the fit. The whole framework in general of a generalized additive model is a regression, but you're wrapping the predictors in a smooth function. And the MGC pack, GCV package will do most of this for you. It will choose a default smoother and it will choose the tuning parameters for you straight out of the box and it will fit very, very well. So hopefully I've convinced those of you who like to use regression that this is worth a try. It will often lead you to a much better model. Thanks. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, what an absolutely relaxing and enjoyable um, introduction to <laughs> really complex <laughs> regression. Um, right, okay, we're going to go straight in now. Uh, unfortunately, our next speakers are running late due to train issues. So we're jumping on to our uh, next speaker, which is Adnan. I'm glad it's not a surprise and they managed to find you. <laughs> Okay, morning everyone. So yeah, my name is Adnan Sharufi, and I'm a data scientist at the NHS BSA 
or the NHS Business Services Authority. And today I'm going to talk to you about a project I've been involved with, which is developing a DB plier based address matching package. All right, so the structure of today's presentation is fairly straightforward. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a bit of an introduction uh, about the BSA, who I work for. Uh, secondly, a bit more about the challenge or the problem that we were facing. After that, uh, I'll give you a quick introduction to DB Player. Some of you guys will have used it, some of you may, may not have used it. After that, I'll talk to you about the package itself, uh, how it works, some considerations you, you need to be aware of if you plan on using it yourself. Thirdly, I'll give you an example of a use case that we've used internally to conduct a type of analysis that we weren't able to do before using the package and the functions inside the package. And then finally, uh, I'll go through some next steps. So if, this, if some of you guys are interested in using this, I'll give you some pointers about things, a couple of links, uh, maybe reference to the code, so you can go away and hopefully look into it yourselves a bit. So, introduction. Uh, firstly, about the NHS BSA, or the Business Services Authority, uh, some of you guys may or may not have heard of it, but basically we're an arm's length body of the DHSC, and within the BSA, the data science team that I work for, what we have to do, or what our aim, is to live, deliver new insights through innovation, experimentation, and collaboration with data. Uh, and the BSA is a great place to do that, because if you look at the screen, lots of some, you know, some very impressive statistics, lots of you know, some big numbers. But yeah, some of the key data assets that we work with are like NHS prescriptions data. We you know, process, store, and analyze those. Uh, NHS dental data, NHS jobs, NHS pensions, and a whole bunch of others. So yeah, from a data scientist perspective, it's a good place to be. The challenge itself, um, you know, address matching is one of those things that probably everyone in the room at some point has done, um, kind of a rites of passage of a data scientist. And the issue, I guess, in a nutshell, is that across different tables or systems or database tables, you have patient information, could be the name, could be their address, and it's spelt or misspelt differently. And what you need to do, or you want to do, is you want to like cross-reference what's going on and try and identify which records are likely to be the same, despite the fact they're spelt differently. So yeah, it's not a particularly glamorous task. Uh, however, it's a sort of thing that if you do it a lot, it can be extremely time consuming. And <clears throat> another aspect of address matching is that it's a sort of thing it's often done at scale. So let's say, you know, at our place we work with prescriptions data quite a lot. Let's say you want to match 20 million prescription forms or the addresses from those against a comprehensive list of UK addresses. Let's say 30 to 35 million addresses, which you can get from an example of that would be Ordnance Survey address base. If you want to do a match, matching exercise like that, R is not the best tool for it because you're going to struggle to get both those data sets in and then you're going to struggle to do the actual analysis yourself. With that in mind, I think address matching at scale, and it is often done at scale, is the sort of thing that people often do in a database using SQL. Uh, and this is where dbplyr comes in. So what is dbplyr? Uh, it's an R package. It's been around for a couple of years now. Fantastic package. Uh, you should look into it. And it helps users use remote database tables as if they were in-memory data frames. So what does that actually mean? So let's say I've got a database table with 500 million records. And in my, if I can connect to that from our studio, I could run that DB player code on the left. So yeah, it's just, it's a simple aggregation and then or arranging the results. And you're probably thinking, okay, that's, that's pretty straightforward. I guess the problem is you can't get those 500 million records into your R Studio in the first place. 
So what's happening is you're, you're connecting to the database, you're not bringing it in. You run your R code under the hood, that's then generated into SQL, and at that point, the data is still residing on the database. Let's say as a, as, as a result of the aggregation, those 500 million records might be squashed down to say 1,000. At that point, you could collect the data, because it might be like less than a meg or even smaller, produce a bunch of plots, do whatever you want. Or, after you've done your calculation, you could push the results back to the database. And in that instance, at no point would the data have been rest within your RStudio environment. So, dbplyr, it has a couple of benefits, really good benefits. You can write functions uh, in your normal dplyr code, which in my opinion is a lot easier than using PLSQL, and it's a lot easier to read, and it's a lot easier for other people to pick up. You know, a function where you aggregate the data in a couple of ways, bring it in, do some plots. Again, super quick in dbplyr. Another thing, if you have a, a workflow, maybe you've got like five SQL scripts uh, in addition to five R scripts, what you could do is get the SQL scripts, rewrite them in dbplyr, and then all of your 10 scripts are gonna be in one language as opposed to two. Couple of considerations. dbplyr can't do anything that you can't already do in SQL, because ultimately all it's doing is, gener is changing that into SQL code. Secondly, the other thing to be aware of is that the functions available to you depend on the version of SQL that you're using. So at our place, we use Oracle SQL. At your organization, if you have SQL Server, there's gonna be a bunch of functions that we each have that the other doesn't. So about the package itself, which is called Address Matcher. So yeah, going back to that example of the 20 million prescription forms being matched against 30 or so million addresses, if I was, if you're wanting to do that and you wanted to match every record from one side to every record to the other side, you would have this, you know, big mad cross join and it would basically take forever to run. And aside from taking forever to run, it wouldn't really make much sense because if a patient record on the, light, on the left hand side has a Newcastle postcode, you don't need to match it against the Birmingham postcode because you know, Newcastle isn't Birmingham and if you live in Newcastle, it's impossible if you live in Birmingham. Kind of goes without saying. So you, a postcode in effect, ultimately is just like a street or an estate or a collection of houses. So the function works on a postcode level it only matches your patient record against any lookup address that shares the same postcode. Uh, in this example, uh, I've taken a patient address, uh, I've put in a few purposeful typos in there. That postcode has 34 addresses within Ordnance Survey address base, and they would all be the candidate matches or the matches that you were gonna consider. What the function then does, so again, the function itself, haven't said this, all it, all it has is two parameters for each table. So table one, postcode one, address one, table two, postcode two, address two, that's it. Super simple function to use. I could have talked about just this for like 10, 15 minutes, but yeah, because obviously you don't have much time. But the way that it works in summary from a very high level, it's like a tokenized Jarrell Winkler approach. So you get your two addresses, you tokenize them, and then you score every token from one side to every token against the other side using Jarrell Winkler. Uh, if you've never heard of Jarrell Winkler, it's a string similarity algorithm, and you get a score between zero and one. And if, let's say you've got two words, you'll get a high score if they share quite a, a high number of characters, with, with, you know, with few transpositions, and if the start of each word is quite similar. Uh, so for example, paint and painter would have a high score. Paint and desktop would have a low score. So that's kind of like the key behind this 
tokenized Jarrow Winkler approach. There's, there's a lot of zeros in there where you're thinking actually Jarrow Winkler should be giving us a score. So yeah, then there's several layers of logic and thresholds and all the rest that I don't have time to go into, but the code is openly available if you want to look at it. But the end result is ultimately that you get a score for every postcode that you're matching against, and then the, out, the, the function automatically picks the best one. So a couple of considerations. Um, if a patient postcode is wrong, it can't be matched against anything. Um, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't exist, it can't be matched against anything. If it's incorrect, you're going to be matching it against the wrong street. The code in the package has been optimized to work with an Oracle database. If you have a different version of SQL, please get in touch and I can suggest uh, some replacements for some functions. Finally, so yeah, the, fun the function itself is super simple, you know, just six parameters, two tables. But once you get the output, you need to do a bit of work yourself. It may be the case that you have to apply a threshold. For example, I only want matches above the score of 0.7 or 0.6. And you're only going to be able to determine that threshold if you manually validate the results. And that's going to depend on the, you know, the volume of the data that you're working with, the kind of data, you know, how accurate it is, all those kind of things. And then finally, the function returns all matches that have the joint top score. And again, then that's a decision for the user to, to think about. Do I want to then introduce some logic to select between them, keep them all, get rid of them all? Again, it depends on your use case. The most high profile use case we've had so far internally. So we've used this for three different projects. The most, yeah, I guess interesting one so far has been classifying care home prescription forms. Uh, and what we did in this instance is we matched 257 million prescription forms. So that was all prescription forms for sick patients aged 65 or above for the 2021 financial year against the Ordnance Survey address base. And we were able to classify 16 million of those as being from a care home. We, val we did a, you know extensive validation of, of the results. We estimated the accuracy on a prescription form level to be 99.7%. And interestingly, the function was able to I guess deal with, there were sometimes there was patient addresses that were spelt or misspelt well over a hundred different times. And we were able to um, bring those back to one single address from address base. And the, creating that label data set is obviously a fantastic resource going forward. Tons of stuff we can do with it, but it's also enabled the most detailed analysis of care home prescribing to date. Next steps, that analysis, the UK, that use case, that, you know, prescription form level, item level analysis of care home prescribing, uh, which is the you know, most detail that's, that's ever been done, basically. That analysis has been generated using Shiny uh, and Gollum and Scrolly Teller, uh, three R packages. It's available online. Even if, you know, address matching or care homes isn't something you're particularly interested in, Please do have a look. Uh, visually, it's really interesting. Loads of good stuff going on. If you want to learn a bit more about the package or about what, what I've been talking about, I've written up the basis of the talk as a blog on the NHSR community website. Uh, you probably haven't seen it yet because it was only published two, three weeks ago. But yeah, if you're interested in what I've been talking about, have a look at that. All of the code for Address Matcher is on our GitHub page. So yeah, you can download the package in full, or if you want, you can just look into the functions themselves and, you know, pill for the bits that you're interested in. If you're going to do address matching at scale, and you need that comprehensive list of lookup addresses to match your own information against, Oldman Survey address base is a fantastic resource, and it's free. Under the public sector geospatial agreement, you can get that free. Uh, you can get a regular load of it and um, yeah, incredibly useful. And finally, again, if you do plan on doing any kind of address matching with this package, 
or even just using address base or whatever else that's related to what we're talking about, please do get in touch. Okay, thank you very much. So my name has been Adnan Sharufi from the NHS PSA and uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much there, Adna. Great talk and a great example of um, being able to develop an R package, put it out there and it have real application and impact as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Next up, uh, we've got Will, who's going to be talking about some system dynamics in R, I believe. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about uh, system dynamics models in R. I'm going to try and do a little bit of talking about why you might choose R to do it, but also what system dynamics models are um, and how you might go about building them in R. Um, so system dynamics models are a type of simulation model. Um, and simulation modeling is basically a way where you try and take a representation of reality uh, that's relatively simple, um, simple enough to actually build um, reality being quite complex as it is, uh, and try and understand how different parts of systems connect to each other and how changes to one part of a system might impact down the line or upstream. So a kind of classic uh, example would be kind of looking at how a hospital works, for instance, how people move between different wards, move through A&E. Um, for instance. Um, and one of the benefits of simulation modeling is that it allows you to be really explicit in your assumptions. So you can say, this is what I'm modeling, and equally importantly, this is what I'm not modeling. Um, um, and that means that your decisions can be relatively evidence-based. Even if you're a little bit off, you're at least being clear about why you're a bit off. Um, so there's a few different types of simulation modeling. Um, one's agent-based modeling, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but I noticed we had lots of talks about discrete event simulation yesterday. So I thought I'd spend a bit of time talking about the differences between system dynamics modeling, which is what I'm going to focus on, and discrete event simulation. Um, so I think yesterday there were lots of examples of you know, looking at things like ambulance wait times, um, how people move through GP practices, stuff like that, using um, R Simmer, uh, which is a discrete event simulation package. Um, and you've probably heard lots of words like waiting and queues um, and optimization. And that's kind of where there's discrete event simulation models are kind of focused. Um, so it's these not necessarily small, but relatively small compared to system dynamic systems. Um, where you're looking at trying to optimize the, the movement of people or patients through a system. Um, um, system dynamics models, on the other hand, are much bigger. So you're generally looking at kind of whole emergency, urgent and emergency care systems, or even things like climate change or tax policy uh, would kind of be applicable for system dynamics models. Um, which tend to treat things as more of a flow. So rather than necessarily looking at individual patients as you might in discrete event simulation, you're kind of more looking at how, how patients flow between different systems um, in system dynamics. So um, as a couple of examples of system dynamics models, so on the right of the screen, there's uh, a model that was developed by Cambridge University in uh, the east of England looking at how COVID might pan out. So it was a, a relatively contained model um, uh, in that it just looked at acute utilization. Um, so what it did was look at how infection rates might vary based on different policies, and then how that would translate to how many beds were occupied. Um, and there were a couple of uses. So one use was kind of looking at what might happen based on different policies. Um, you know, if we do uh, social distancing, how might that affect hospital beds? Um, but the other use is to kind of look at what trajectory we might be on and then act as a kind of early warning system. Um, so, you know, if we start to go up in this particular time period, it looks like maybe we're on track to, to peak this high at this point in time. And if we want to get off that track, we need to do something. Um, and what policies might be sufficient to do that? 
Um, so it's quite an operational use, a little bit like discrete event simulation, but still kind of much more around bigger systems. The other example on the uh, left is much bigger. So I work in public health, um, and one of the things we always kind of struggle with is evidencing really long-term preventative uh, interventions, um, especially at a, you know, a local level. So this model was developed uh, in Toronto and looks at how disability prevalence might change over the course of decades uh, based on things like housing interventions and, and those kind of job interventions and things like that. So really, you know, long causal chains, really, really complex systems. Um, they, you know, the model might not be 100% accurate, but at least provides uh, what can be quite a rare evidence base for doing those preventative actions at a local level. So in terms of how we can do it, there's loads of proprietary software. Um, I'm hoping that I'm preaching to the converted when I say R has lots of benefits over proprietary software. Um, as one example, there's three ICBs in my region doing urgent and emergency care system dynamics modeling at the moment. They're all using different pieces of software, so none of them are interoperable. We can share the, the high level concepts, the high level outputs, but we can't copy and paste between. Um, um, I should also mention you can do it in Python as well, although I guess everyone who needs to hear that is in a different room, but there we are. Um, um, so I thought the easiest way to kind of start would be to go through a relatively simple model. Um, so this is a model of hospital or a hospital ward occupancy um, and system dynamics models have this kind of uh, grammar of how diagrams should look and you can mostly replicate it in R. It's not quite, but it's, it's hopefully close enough. Um, so if we walk through this diagram, at the furthest left, we have population. Um, and this is in a circle. Traditionally, it's a cloud and system dynamics parlance, but um, we don't have clouds in R, at least in this package. Uh, so it's a circle, because that's the closest I could get. But um, for the sake of our model, um, we're assuming that population is an exogenous variable. So it's a variable that we're not really interested in how it's created, what goes into it. It's just a limitless pool of people. We could model how population gets created, births and deaths and things like that, immigration. Um, but we're trying to model hospital board. It feels a little bit overkill to be kind of modeling how many people are born each week or day or whatever. Um, so we just assume for the simplicity that population is an unlimited number. Um, and then people flow uh, through being admitted uh, to being in a ward, so having occupancy. And the volume of that flow is determined by something that we call an auxiliary variable, which is admission rate. And admission rate is, in our case, set outside of the model. Um, so people flow by being admitted into occupancy, and as that happens, the, the occupancy, which is a stock, will increase. So it's a little bit like if you turn the tap on a bathtub, the level of the bath would increase, assuming you've got your plug in, of course. Um, so once people are on the board, that stock would just increase and increase and increase. But actually, we have a, we have a process where people can leave the ward through discharges, which is another flow. So people flow from occupancy through discharges into discharged. You'll notice discharged is another circle. We don't really care for the sake of this model where people go when they're discharged. Um, and uh, you can see there's a little bit more of a complex process uh, for discharges. So this is called a feedback loop. Um, and in this case, as occupancy uh, increases, the discharge rate increases. Um, because there's more pressure to get people out of hospital. So I'm not sure how well people will be able to read this, but this is basically how that model would uh, be defined in R code. So uh, at the top, we define a few different um, parameters. So simulation time, which is the time that we're going to simulate over, things like the occupancy, things like auxiliary variables like discharge rate. Um, and then we uh, define a model 
um, which is a function. We pass those things in, uh, and then we, for each time step, we will do a number of different processes. So we'll calculate the, the pressure. So that was uh, that treatment pressure, which is part of the feedback loop. That's based on whether the ward is over capacity or not. We'll uh, calculate the admission flow. So that's people going from population to occupancy. Um, in this case, I was really lazy. So it's just a random number between one and 10, um, but you could do it much more complicatedly, much more accurately. Um, we calculate the discharge flow, so that's based on the occupancy, the discharge rate, and the pressure, uh, just a calculation based on all of those. And then we integrate the stock, so we integrate the occupancy, which is basically where we take the occupancy at a given point of time, we add the new admissions, and we minus the discharges to get what the new occupancy will be. Um, and finally, we return all the that then list. Um, and then we use a package called dsolve, uh, which runs this model over the time steps, uh, puts it into a data frame, and then at that point it's a standard R object, so we can do boring stuff like a base R plot, or we could do really fancy stuff like shiny or interactive plotting or, or however else we wanted to visualize it. Um, so we've got a few more slides about kind of different components of the system dynamics model. So. Uh, We've kind of been over some of this already. So stocks and flows um, are the kind of basic building blocks. So our occupancy was a stock. We had the flows of admissions and discharges, um, and that's basically how people flow across the system. We had an example of a feedback loop, which is kind of circular causal links that allow one part of the system to impact another part of the system, which impacts that part again. Um, and we had a couple of examples of auxiliary variables that are kind of one of the ways that we simplify models by um, just keeping things uh, outside of the model. Um, so admission rate and discharge rate were kind of defined. In our model, they were fixed. They don't need to be fixed. They can vary over time. Um, so we can do things like continuous change, which can be really useful for things like seasonality. So we can say admissions get high during the winter and get low during the summer, for instance. Um, it's relatively easy to do. Um, slightly harder is doing kind of abrupt changes. Um, so things like uh, policy changes. So it might be that on this day, we change the policy and stop as many people flowing from Ward A and put them into Ward B, for instance. Um, or it can be based on uh, uh, reaching a threshold within the model. So it could be that instead of treatment pressure increasing once we go over capacity, admissions stop when we go over capacity. Um, and then as soon as capacity gets, uh, as soon as occupancy gets below capacity, admissions can start again. Um, and we can also do things like delays. Uh, so people spending time in a ward like length of stay, for instance, can be modeled. Um, uh, I'm not gonna go through integration in too much detail because it's a lot of maths um, and you don't really need to understand it to get started with system dynamics, but there are a couple of kind of key key things that can be good to know. Um, basically, when a system dynamics model runs, you're approximating uh, the value of a curve, um, to put it simply. Um, and there's various parameters that you need to adjust to better or worse approximate that curve. Obviously, the, you choose better, uh, all things being equal, but it's slower. Um, so there comes a point when you kind of take what you can get. Um, so the two main parameters around that are step size, uh, and the solver method. So step size, generally, you want to keep relatively small. Um, and the solver method, Euler and Rung, are kind of the default ones. Our default is the one called L-Soda. Um, but don't necessarily need to understand huge amounts of detail of that to get the idea of some plots there, which might kind of illustrate kind of how these different methods approximate things. So the, uh, in the bottom plots, the blue points are what the model is estimating and the red line is the actual. So we can see uh, using smaller step sizes, for instance, than those middle two plots, you get much closer to the line. Um, you can also bring in the rest of R. So uh, you can use test that, diagrammer, things like that to, to, to bring in the rest of the benefits of R. Um, 
as I sort of mentioned, there's a couple of R packages that can be used to work with models developed in some proprietary software. It's a little bit of a pain, but it does work. Um, and of course, Shiny can be used. So this is a, uh, I don't know if it will actually work, but this is a Shiny app we built looking at uh, uh, how um, infection rates change. And the good thing about this uh, is that end users can then add new stocks. So we can add like a care home uh, population. Um, and then the end user can basically build their own system dynamics model without needing to know how to code, um, which is essentially impossible with kind of the standard off the shelf system dynamic software. Um, and finally, uh, I'll just leave with a couple of other resources. So there's a really good book by um, um, someone called Jim Duggan uh, called System Dynamics Modeling in R. It's got a whole GitHub repo uh, with kind of the code behind the book, a really, really good introduction. Um, as part of a fellowship I did with Cambridge University, there's a uh, GitHub repo which has a load of uh, RMDs and apps and things around simulation modeling, mostly focusing on, on system dynamics. And finally, there's a really good example of a system dynamics model that uh, the strategy unit did on mental health uh, during COVID. Um, really, really complex model, really nice shiny app that allows end users to kind of relatively simply get a really good understanding of what might happen with mental health modeling. But I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Will. Great talk and actually a great overview of uh, how using system dynamics in R. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'd like to um, introduce to you um, Rezi Aghani, uh, who um, is going to talk to us about the R Girls School Network. So I'm really interested to hear all about this. Thank you, Rezi. Okay, th thank you very much for inviting me today to talk about our project. Uh, we started this project about a year ago, so I'll, I'll introduce you the details. So we have the background to look at the aims, where we are at the moment, what the challenges this faces, and how everybody in probably this community can help us with our project. Okay, first up is about me, then I'll talk about the school and then where the roots of this project started. A little bit about myself, I have a, a degree and a PhD in mathematics. I worked for a pharmaceutical company in Switzerland where I was a SAS programmer, but I was a contractor working with them. Then I went into teaching and currently I'm a head teacher at Green Oak Academy. A little bit about our school, it's based in Birmingham, it's in Moseley. It's Birmingham's class as the seventh most deprived um, place in Birmingham. We're also a small school. We, have, we don't have 70 students now. We've gone up to 80 students this year. So that's slightly, we were 70 at the beginning, but we've had a few more intake. Uh, we, we're, never, we're very rarely in credit. So if um, we, we do, we get sponsors, we get donations in to keep our school going. We work very hard. We have a, a lot of love and affection in the school and we are an Islamic ethos school. So there's a lot of prayers going on in the school with the girls as well. You can see us based in Birmingham, which you're here. The last time I gave this presentation, it was in London. Um, if you look at the stars there, that's our Ofsted report. When I first started the school, we were uh, requirements to improve. So we've now gone to good for quality of education, outstanding behavior good personal development of pupils and good leadership and management. We're hoping to get to outstanding and hopefully this project will lead us that way as well because it's something that we're doing for the community. We don't just use, uh, if you look at the, the plots here, these are the plots that the teachers do for the students. So we actually used R before we started our project. So it's already being used in the school to, to show the progress of the students. They were coming in with the lowest scores and as they were repeating the test over and over again, we, they, they started to see their grades improving and it motivated them as well. Okay, so where did we start? 
Okay, so Professor Mohammed, most of you will know him here, and he came along to me, and this, this is a usual thing. He was a governor at the at school at the, at the time, and he said, oh, could we use R in the lessons? And we might be able to get some funding. So I said, oh, yes, yes. It sounds like an excellent idea. We've had a new change of curriculum recently where there's been a lot of mathematics, like in science and geography, and formulas that the students need to learn. So I said, yeah, let's go for that um, thing. So we put a bid in. There's a, a couple of names I recognise who are our supporters. So hopefully I'll get to meet you at a break time. And then we put the bid into the R Consortium and they gave us a, a seeding, really, seed funding to get us going. Uh, we did have a contact with the R Consortium with uh, David, David Spielberg and um, Hadley Wickham. He got in contact with us as well. Uh, and uh, they were our supporters. Okay, let's go to the aims of the project. We could see the use of using R. We're not actually teaching girls how to use R. We're looking at our curriculum and how R can support their learning. So when they do like maths lessons in R, it's not for, um, we're not teaching, we're teaching them the curriculum. So they'll be able to do maths processes using R. We're getting the teachers to incorporate those into their lessons and, and we enable them to get the joy of art and they have been enjoying it as well. They haven't just been sitting in our lessons, it has been beneficial to them. Okay, so the progress that we've made so far, we've got lesson plans, we've got a website, we've got a Twitter account and we're also using Slack to communicate with other ladies all over the world. So it's not just uh, us based at our teachers. So if you look at, we have a dedicated website for our girls um, and on there you can see there's ready-made lessons for math, science and geography. Our original, original um, funding was for 10 lessons and for networking and for also uh, setting up a website as well. So the website's there, so you can go and have a look on there. So on the, on the website, we decided, when we had a programmer working with us, he decided the best way forward was for, to use Markdown. I also had training from the NHS as well, where I learned how an introduction to R. So that's, it's just been a little bit of a, it's been a learning curve for all of us as well. So they are lessons, we use our markdown and the lessons are in the way that they're being delivered as you would in an English curriculum. Okay, so we've got here, in my opinion, the program code they were actually quite fun. This is feedback from the children. Once you got a hang of it, it was a great feeling knowing that I was able to code a whole bar chart all by myself and I feel proud of myself for doing so. I would recommend all students and teachers to give it a go in class. This is the sort of feedback we were getting from the children. Okay, this is a, a maths lessons that we've got in there. We've got generating sequences, uh, part one and two. So there's the different types of sequences that you can create. Pythagoras' theorem was in there as well. An equation of a straight line uh, graphs are there. And two more lessons as well in maths. We also had a geography lesson two geography lessons. The first lesson that we had on there is actually developed by one of the R ladies who got in touch with us, Jenny Sloan, and she actually wanted to contribute a lesson to our website. So it's not just about what we've been doing, it's what others have been contributing to us. So she gave us data about uh, from um, Australian cities and so they were able to do a geography lesson on there. We also had one where you'd able to take coordinates and be able to plot those and find a place in Google Maps using their coordinates. So that was what a lesson that we had for our children, but actually somebody in one of the other our ladies called Nasreen, she actually used our lesson in one of her universities for our university students. So it's not just what we're doing for ourselves, it's what's been able to be used by everybody else as well. So it can be developed further. Okay, we also had science lesson where they actually collected data. The students collected their own data and then they were able to plot the uh, graphs for, um, from their lesson. 
Okay, so a typical lesson was the coding, and when they knitted the lesson together, they managed to get the actual lesson as a HTML file, which they could read, and which they knew what to do on there. So it was sort of telling them the keywords, and this is what a typical lesson would like look like in an English school, where you'd have your uh, learning objective, success criteria, keywords, and what they're going to be doing at that time. Okay, so... We, we had an activity where we just said, okay, look, look at this, what can you recognize from me? So you're given a piece of data where you can take in, you've got the program, then you can like edit bits in there so you can create your own graphs. This is the feedback that we had from the students. Um, and it was amazing, it's so cool, I loved it. This is what we put on our blog as well. So on our Twitter account, you'll be able to see this feedback. I've learned a lot. Data, I never knew it would be so fun. Definitely want to do this again. I found this fun and interesting and would love to continue doing this. I really enjoyed this lesson. Thank you very much for the experience. This was a positive feedback that we're getting from the children after their lessons. Okay, so when Jenny Sloan came to us, she actually took... Um, she took the, the, the words and she, she went into our word cloud and she put the, the feedback from the girls on, on, uh, onto this here. And I think that if you go on our blog, you'll be able to read about what the, what, what the, um, the contributors have put on there. So the lesson on the plotting of the, the rain, rainfall in Australia with our girls, you, you'll be able to see the blogs based on this and also that lesson about the mapping, the coordinates being used by, I think it was by Nasreen. Okay, if you go on to our Twitter account, you'll be able to see that we, uh, we've got about 312 followers. I think that was in July when this was taken as a snapshot. So we've got a few more followers and I think we, we were following 512 any, anything with our girls in, I was going and following because I knew that we needed to make sure that we had our, our um, we were able to, to um, advertise ourselves to everybody, that we were available where we were. Okay, so the challenges that we're facing, this is every school, this is not just ourselves, it's staffing, it's time, it's money, the equipment, and I think last year was more COVID. Okay, so this is also a quote, 45% of teachers in England plan to quit within the last, in, in five years of starting their teaching profession. Because it is stressful, it's not an easy job to do. Remember, if you've got teenage children, and we've got a whole class of them, we've got to look after all those children where you might just have one or two in your house. So just think about uh, what sort of stresses that we face. Okay, so the nice surprises that we had, we had lots of positive feedback. We had worldwide coverage as well, that we had other ladies from all over the world contacting us. And we had lots of networking opportunities. And we also had uh, visitors from overseas. And here's a picture of uh, me, Mrs. Atdawala, and Jenny Sloan in my office. I'm still thinking about that safe, shouldn't be shown on there, but it's there. Okay, so, so what sort of helped uh, the supporters that we've had so far has been volunteers at Green Oak Academy working with us. We've, we're very thankful to the Art Consortium for giving us our initial funding. Ascent helped us with our cloud. They paid for our first year license to help us get, get going. Our ladies are supporting us as it is, and the NHS are um, organisations also helping us as well. So Jenny Sloan was our contributor to the website that she built in R. We also had Batul, I think Batul is sitting in here somewhere, I think she's got a session this afternoon, I've seen her name on there. So she was doing some interactive um, uh, learn R lessons for us and the Nasreen was also uh, contributed to the blog and we also had some of the Iman uh, working with us as well. Okay, so our future plans we still need we still need to network with other teachers and schools it's not easy because to find time to come out to do a, a training session with the teachers because they're not going to be able to work on their own even if we go ahead with uh, 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 di disseminating our information to the other schools but we do need more lessons and we are hoping to have our girls conference 
similar to this so that the girls from the schools can get together and say what where their our story was and we are looking for people to help sponsor us as well to help us to support our cause okay so thank you thank you very much this is about uh, my talk for um, our girls network this is our first year thank you for listening to me Thank you so much, Razia. That is what a fantastic initiative, and I can't wait to hear more. Um, I hope you come back and tell us how it's gone and next year's conference as well and how it continues to grow. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Another big round of applause, actually. It's a huge, huge project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, and our last speaker before the break, is going to be Colin. And, um, well, hopefully there won't be... Well, we'll be indebted to you for this one, maybe. <laughs> right, thank you very much. I'm a bit of a wanderer, so I apologise. Uh, so I'm just going to be wandering up and down. So my name's Colin Gillespie. I'm one of the co-founders of Jumping Rivers. Uh, we do part data science and part coasters. Uh, I see many people sort of walk by, picked up a coaster, put them in the back pocket, and then just carried on. Uh, not, there's a few nodding faces here. Uh, my background, I've been using R, I think, for longer than some of you guys have been alive. So I started in 2000, which is starting to be the break-even point in this audience. So I first started using R in my PhD, and I suspect very similar to the NHS, my university moved to R because it was free, and S plus cost an arm and a leg, and essentially everything you could ever uh, own. Also wrote a book many years ago, got roped into that. Jumping rivers, we basically do all things data science, okay? So anything R, anything Python. We're doing a lot of managed R Studio, sorry, Posit. You remember the, the name now? Posit services, so we set up a lot of these instances and maintain it for clients. We do a lot of shiny development and uh, dashboards, that sort of stuff. Right, what are we talking about today? Technical debt, I feel quite bad because the last talk was so positive and so nice. And I'm just going to say how crap we all are. And that just doesn't feel like the nice part just before coffee. So apologies. I'll try and end up with a ha happy, upbeat note, but it's not going to work. So I'm just going to sort of have a little moan. My talks typically focus on what I'm currently thinking about at Jumping Rivers, right? So this is sort of what we're doing just now and what we're having internal conversations. It's not just something I thought of, I'll just talk about this. It's been on my mind. We've been having internal discussions. So we've been going around for six years, right? And we've grown from a size of sort of two or three, and there's now about 30 of us. And we're gradually having that painful situation where we are using stuff that someone developed a few years ago, and it's a bit ropey, and we're trying to work with it. And the worst thing about all of this at Jumping Rivers is I'm usually the person to blame, right? It's much nicer when you can blame someone else, right? It's that person over there. It's a the person that left. It's their fault. It's usually my fault, right? So every time I'm moaning, I'm moaning about myself. And we've got it quite easy, so we've grown to 30, and I think in the last six years we've only had two people leave at Jumping Rivers, right? So in terms of the, sort of the, the team, it's been quite stable, and it's still hell on earth trying to maintain code, right? So I, I do understand this. So what's tech debt? So it's a cost of additional rework uh, caused by choosing an easy, limited solution. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, we're the NHS, we always plan for the long-term future. We never do things right at the last minute. So apologies that I've just got this wrong, but just in case there's that one person in the room that doesn't have short-term goals. And it's instead, they're basically choosing the, the easy way, and there could be a good reason for that, right? I'm going to suggest that COVID was perhaps not the most well-planned out pandemic. You know, we didn't have a plan to sort of deal with this pandemic that sprung up. And so, you know, things had to be built quickly. But then we're having to sort of pay for that later on. And where does tech debt come from? So if we go to Wikipedia, it's actually got around about 15 to 16 different things. Uh, the top one is business pressure, which is basically blame your boss, right? You know, that's pretty much it. Uh, my conversion to PDF from Google Slides has got a car blame your boss, but it's also known as blame, blame your boss, right? So that's my boss as well. Uh, she's horrible, and unfortunately I'm married to her as well, which makes it even worse. So, never work. In fact, we started the company together, and she claimed the title of CEO, so there you go. 
So, I think we're a bit of an odd bunch, right? You know, we're quite technical. You know, how many of us spend, what, half a day coding? Maybe all of a day coding? But would you describe yourself as a software engineer or a programmer? And yet, we spend all day, well, some of us might spend all day sitting at a console, programming in R, programming in Python, but we would never describe ourselves as a software engineer or a programmer. We would say ourselves as health economist, visualizer, you know, analyst, statistician, but not a software engineer. Yet we do software all the time, every day. And I think in terms of what we do, we tend to work in small, uh, with smaller pieces of software, right? We're not building Twitter, you know, that stable, robust platform that we all know. Uh, we're not building anything like that. Instead, we're building much smaller things. And we typically get one-off pieces of work, right? So maybe it's a Cisco analysis, right? You know, you've got some data, you need to analyze it, and then you need to get a report, and then you pass it on, and you're, that, that's pretty much it. You might tweak it, but that's more or less it. It might, it's relatively simple pieces of software. I'm not saying that to demean what we do, but there's not 300 engineers all working on the same thing, right? There's a couple of people all working on a dashboard. That's not the same scale as building, you know, massive infrastructure, you know, that sort of thing. So in the grand scheme of things, what we're working on is relatively simple in terms of programming. Really hard in terms of the data is horrible, the statistics are quite hard, and you're not quite sure what's been asked for, right? That's not the same as, you know, that, that's sort of slightly different. And when I was thinking about this, it's like, well, when I'm looking at jumping rivers, what, what stuff do we, do we have? What, what the sort of tech deck smells? And I realize I'm mixing up metaphors here. And I think that the, we're frightened to change things would be the first thing, right? So I was going through some of the, the R packages we use for, for training material, and there's been a file there that essentially hasn't worked in three years, right? If you look at the code, it couldn't have worked in three years, and no one's ever thought, I'll just delete that because it's like, but it's not breaking anything, so I'm just going to leave that little bit of R code in case it's doing something. And we'll just all sort of walk away. You know, don't touch it, because then you'll get blamed. And so you're sort of frightened to change things. That's not good. Handing over projects is hard, right? You know, so you're, you're moving from one project to another, and you're passing it on. You know, are you proud of what's been left, or do you run out the door and not give a folding email address, right? If someone wins the lottery, much nicer than saying being hit by a bus, would that sort of cause massive problems or would you all sort of cry into your mineral water and, and your cups of tea and just think, oh, oh no, who's going to take over this? There's a low probability that the code will run, right? You know, if, you know, think, and here's a, you know, if you've given a talk yesterday, could I take your code and run it and get the same results, right? And at least hope that the people who have given talks, that should be true, right? Again, I'm looking at myself and that's not true of all code I've, I've written. But that's sort of like a minimum standard, you know? So what to do, right? I don't, I'm not trying to be completely pessimistic. Uh, so I'm from Glasgow, we're a much more happy bunch, whereas further north you go on like in Aberdeen, they're miserable as sin. Uh, so Glaswegians are much more choppy people. So what do we do? What, what sort of things can we recommend? So I'm going to suggest the next time you make a change to your code, fix something small, right? Start with the small things in life, little happy things. And so, you know, you go into the code, you're, you're fixing something, you're adding a feature, and just set yourself a goal to fix something small. I'm not talking about a major refactoring, I'm not talking about restructuring everything you've got. Just something small, right? Look at the README. Of course you've got a README, because why wouldn't you have a README? <clears throat> but look at the README. Is it up to date? Could you fix one sentence? Is there spelling? You know, something small that just actually helps things, right? Not a massive thing. Rename some variables. So I think the biggest thing I've learned is when I started, you know, building stuff that we're now using six years later, I was cool. You know, I had wrote really cool bits of code that was succinct and small. Current me hates past me with a massive passion because now I see a variable called X. I think, what on earth is that? Right? So maybe rename a variable to something a bit more informative, useful, longer, right? Typically, you write a bit of code once, and then you read it multiple times. So actually giving something a slightly longer name is, you know, is a little bit longer to type, but future you will thank current you. Perhaps rename inspire a file. 
And if it's Christmas, you could even write a test, right? That could be a Christmas present. You know, writing yourself a little small test just to make sure it works, right? Refactor a function, right? Nothing massive, because I know you, you know, we're all busy, right? You've got lots of other things to do. The idea that you could suddenly sit down with a bit of software and spend two weeks fixing it and making it look perfect isn't going to happen, right? That's the real world. But I think some of them, spending five minutes, 10 minutes, just making a little tweak, making it a little better. And if you can encourage that practice, then things just gradually get a bit better. And it's not this horrible pain. Now the hard part, right? Agree red lines, right? And I think if Brexit has taught us anything, red lines are a good thing, right? I don't know if it's too soon for Brexit jokes. It's probably never too soon. Uh, R packages, so we write lots and lots of R code, right? So our red lines are, if you've got an R package, it can have any notes and it can't have any warnings. Something's a bit fuzzy about notes, right? And we enforce that, right? That's what we, we say, you know, so you've got an R package, no notes, no warnings, unless there's a, a good reason. It must pass linting. So you don't know what linting is. Linting is essentially a little program that looks through your R code and says you should have a space here and that bracket is too far away. And you know, it sets up sort of standards and style guides. Right? So we've got you know, every bit of code we have must have a linter. Right? It's not negotiable, that's our red line. What I didn't realize, data scientists are pains to work with. It's so literal. As we said we had a linter, but we didn't say that people couldn't make exceptions. So now the thing I'm looking at is all the code written by myself and the colleagues who thought, well, I've got a linter, but I'm just going to make this exception, this exception, this exception. Because to be honest, I couldn't be bothered fixing and doing it properly at the time. So think with details because our, myself and our colleagues like details. It must have a code on this file, right? So I'm really passionate about this. And that's nothing hard other than a file called code owners in your repo where you say who owns the code, right? And that's usually like a Git name or, you know, your GitLab or GitHub name. So you might just have A, B and C, right? So that means that someone can come along and they can look at this code and go, oh, I know who owns this code. I know who wrote this code. I know who's in charge of this code. I know who to bother when things break. Right? You can also start getting a bit more clever because if every repo you've got has got a code on this file, then you could write a little for loop and you can imagine grabbing all the repos that you've got, getting all the people who own all the code and you can do a little table. Right? You know, that's sort of also relatively straightforward. And that one thing made it really, well, made it much easier when, when John left because we were able to, to just grab all our repos and say, which code does John own, right? You know, which of these repos is John involved in? And then we were able to, to, to work at the business level and sort of take John away and put someone else in. Right. I don't think any of those things are that hard. Right. Code review and integration, right? So again, we use a lot of Git. Continuous integration, what's continuous integration? Basically all that is, is when you submit your code to GitHub or GitLab, a little robot in the clouds looks at your code, does some stuff, and then tells you if you've passed or failed. That's all continuous integration. So it's a purely automatic step. The idea being that you don't know it exists unless something bad has gone wrong, right? So continuous integration would just be coming along, say, looking at the style, and in theory it should pass. If it passes, it just goes away and doesn't bother you. And if it fails, it'll come and shout in your face saying, why have you messed up? Fix it now. Right. So this is our workflow, right? So we've got a data scientist, uh, particularly well paid data scientist because he's got a top hat on and he wants to push to the main branch, right? But we don't allow that. So that's one of our red lines as well. No one's allowed to push to the main branch, right? It's amazing how many conversations I have with my colleagues about why what they are doing is an exception to the rule, right? Everybody likes exception. They're special. We were special. Good for everyone else, but not for me. And I have the same conversation of, oh, what I'm doing is different because, well, I'm just different and try and stick to this, right? So no one's ever allowed to push to main, right? No ifs, no buts. Instead, what they should do is they should push to a little dev branch, right? So here's a little shiny app and we're changing a drop down menu, right? And then without anything happening, that little shiny app automatically gets pushed up to another server, right? So there's no human being involved, a little top hat, hat dude pushes to the main dev branch, then that just brings up this dashboard to, to a staging server without anyone having to do anything, right? No one has to run the code, no one has to look at the code, the computer's doing it all. Right? Then the code owner comes along, 
and she'll have a look at the changes and if she's happy she will allow them to go into main and if she's unhappy then writes a nice set of reviews and then push back down to the data scientist who can go and fix them okay the crucial part is by the time this person comes to review the code you want to get all the trivial tedious things out of the road right so the continuous integration is really important for setting those guidelines in terms of style you don't want this person to be wasting their time saying oh you should have a comma there or you can't spell you know you should run it through a spell check right you want the computer to take care of all that because essentially this person gets like three goes to be nasty and critical and after that things start getting a bit afraid right so this person can sort of be vaguely critical two or three times saying you know oh you should fix that you should fix that and you should fix that they don't have to be they can say it's all perfect and that's great but you don't want them wasting their time with the trivial stuff right you want the computer to tell that and then finally it all goes up to the main so this is a, a process okay and once it's set up it saves so much time right and we often have conversations especially with clients saying well our team's too small and well we don't really need that and but this is going to take more time because someone now has to look at the code and you know there's a, there's a definite lag as someone who's spent days banging their head at bugs having this step is probably saves so much time you know you, you, you're you're putting that upfront cost of someone actually having to understand what you wrote and that saves so much time a year later when you're having to reread stuff that's something that's been written right the stuff that i wrote and i've pushed right at the start of the company that no one looked over isn't the best if i'm entirely honest it could do with a little bit of improvement there's a definite noticeable difference when someone else has to look at it and has to understand it and has to be able to run it there's just things are just a bit better Right. So before you say what is and what isn't required, slightly uh, tricky question is, how important is it for your stuff to work? Right. Does it matter if it works? Does it matter if it works next year? Is it a big deal? And I'm not saying that to demean, because some of the stuff that we do, it doesn't matter if it works in a year's time, right? It might not matter, right? I would imagine that's in the minority of what we do, but some of the stuff is just probably it's like, yeah, it's just a quick thing. I'm just wanting something up and running. It's okay, fine. But I think the important thing is to make a conscious decision, right? Whatever workflow you go for, you think, right, this is what I'm going for, and this is what I'm doing, and these are my, my rules. And it's sometimes, well, I say it's actually much easier to do that before looking at particular things, you know, coming up with the rules, and then these are my rules, these are what we're going to follow as a team, and then everything's held against because when you start going into nitty gritty there's always exceptions right i'm going to suggest everyone in this room is going to be good at giving exceptions of why they're different why they're special so coming up with these rules beforehand and it might be okay to be suboptimal right it really might be so it might be fine of if you're developing a proof of concept to quickly get something through and go right i've got a rough idea it's on get now i'm going to go back and do it properly and that can be planned right that's okay we're also working with a client that's going to be essentially a proper statistical analysis we're working with registries on a particular disease uh, and we're, we're reporting back to farmer so our pipeline is now different because we have to have two independent reviewers right so before anything can go into the main branch someone changes the code and then two people all also have to review that code right because we can't mess things up so we've made a conscious decision and we've actually increased it so data science uh, tech debt is different but it's still important right it's not the sort of stuff that you get in other companies because i think we just work on things very quickly we're getting statistical analysis we're getting date dashboards quite quick quite dirty if we're a bit honest but they go through fix a little things i'm a big fan of using git and a big fan of using ci and i think the best piece of advice i can give you is blame the boss because it's definitely her fault in my case Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. That's just, yeah, lots to think about there. And uh, yeah, we all, we can all see ourselves in a, in, in a bit of that talk. Okay, just um, before we have coffee, uh, one quick announcement. Actually, if you turn around at the back of the room, you'll see Rachel in uh, pink and with her hat on. 
Rachel's going to be in the coffee room. If you have signed up to speak to Rachel, please make sure you do. Um, go and find her. You can't miss her. And uh, otherwise, please enjoy your coffee break and we'll see you back here in uh, about 20 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back everyone to our second session for the day. If I could encourage you to come back to your seats if you're with us in the room. And hello to everyone who is on the virtual side. So for our second session today, we've got a variety of talks from different speakers. So I'd like to invite up our first speaker, Nathan Thomas. Is my mic on? Yep, great. Hi everyone, uh, so my name's Nathan. I'm a Principal Workforce Analyst uh, with Health Education England. Uh, currently on to comment to the east of England, but I actually live in the black country not far from here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about using forecasts to understand change. Um, so quite often you've got a nice uh, time series of data, everything's ticking along, nice predictable trends, and then something happens to change things. Uh, and this might be a change that you've made, or it might be a change that happens to you. Um, and, you know, what I'm going to talk about today is a method for uh, investigating that change. So the particular change that we were interested in uh, was how the COVID-19 pandemic had affected NHS staff sickness absence rates in secondary care. Um, questions of interest included by how much did COVID-19 change sickness absence rates? How did this change itself change over time at different points in the course of the pandemic? And how might this information be used to develop better forecasts of future sickness absence rates? Um, and the way that we decided to look at this information was to uh, use pre-pandemic sickness absence data to forecast what sickness absence rates could have looked like if the pandemic never happened, and then compare those forecasts with actual observer rates and measure the difference. So the first job is to choose a forecasting method. Uh, and to do that, uh, it's helpful to look at the data uh, and, and, and see what characteristics of the data might tell you about which forecasting method you should use. So we have some monthly sickness absence rate data for NHS secondary care staff in the east of England. Uh, and the data has the following characteristics. Uh, the sickness absence rates, they change over time. Um, they vary by a range of factors, including staff group, provider, the season, and they potentially involve trends. Um, so what we need is a forecasting method that can take all of these features into account. Um, and one method that is very good at handling all of these is exponential smoothing. So exponential smoothing handles time series trends using weighted averages of past observations. Uh, with the weights decaying exponentially as the observations get older. So the more recent the observation, the higher the associated weight. If you think about uh, you're, you know, getting ready to leave the house, thinking what, what's the weather going to be like, what do I need to wear, you're going to put more weight on what the weather was like five minutes ago than it was like last week. Um, so that's, that's weighting. The state space models use exponential smoothing to identify up to three components of the time series, uh, the level, the trend and the seasonality. So this approach allows us to plausibly model time series data with all of the above characteristics. So creating the model, um, if you've ever used the forecast function in Excel, then you've already used exponential smoothing, um, but Excel doesn't offer you the kind of control that you'd like over key parameters of the model. Uh, and this is where R comes in. Uh, time series model, uh, a time series of monthly sickness absence data uh, from March 2017 onwards for secondary care in the east of England was loaded into R. Uh, and then the data was split into three years of data prior to March 2020. So this is our pre-COVID set. Um, and the remainder of the data, which was post-COVID. And, and then we used the forecast package to create a state space model of the, the pre-COVID training set. 
Uh, a box Cox transformation was applied to improve the normality of residuals. And this is something that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and the forecast package automatically determines the model that fits the training data best, um, which in this case is an ETS ANA model. So uh, this means that the level has additive errors. That's the first day. Uh, there's no trends. That's your N. Uh, and the seasonal errors are also additive. Um, and that's the final A. What I mean by additive is that they don't change with the level. And you can see this uh, in the chart that breaks down each of the components that the forecast package has identified. Um, you've got the observed data at the top there, um, time series, uh, and you can see it's got quite large peaks and troughs in it. Um, and the, the plot of the seasonal variation at the bottom um, shows you that, that where that trend is coming from, those peaks and troughs are mostly driven by seasonal variability with the peaks um, uh, in the winter. And then in the middle, you've got the level. Now, if you're looking at that level plot and you're saying to me, Nathan, I think I see a rising trend in that level. Um, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you there. But the, the, the model selected by the forecast package that says there's no trend. And that's something quite interesting that we'll, we'll, we'll come back to. Um, but, you know, we've made our model uh, and we want to do some diagnostics um, to see how, how good the model is. Uh, and we're looking for the usual kind of things when you do model diagnostics. You know, we want the residuals to be randomly scattered around a mean of zero. Uh, and the... Uh, the, the residual plot is looking pretty good in that sense. Um, the autocorrelation factor plot suggests that the residuals are not correlated, which is another thing we want. However, the result of a box lung test suggests that actually they, they could well be correlated, uh, indicating that there's room for improvement in our model. And if we look, think back to the, the trend that we identified, that could be something uh, where the model could be improved. The model isn't actually picking up that trend when it should be. Um, we also want our residuals to be normally distributed. And if we look at our histogram, I've said it's kind of normal-ish. Uh, I mean, there's only 36 data points here, uh, so we're not going to get a perfectly normal curve. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll say it looks kind of all right. Um, but we've still got this problem with the residuals potentially being correlated. We've still got this uh, trend that the model is picking up. Um, so, you know, with R being R, we can do lots of uh, tweaking with our model, model, testing different values for our parameters and see if we can improve things any. Um, and when I did this, what I found was that um, all of these tweaks um, produce only very minor changes to the forecasts that the model produces and it's the forecasts we're interested in. Uh, so in the end what I decided to do for the purpose of this project was just to keep things simple, go for the most pars parsimonious model, um, which was basically the default with the box, box Cox transformation I mentioned earlier. Um, and Box himself uh, is famous for the dictum, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and hopefully you'll see uh, that this model does uh, indeed prove to be useful. So, forecasts then. Um, we can get the forecast package to um, use the model that it's selected for the observed data uh, and, and project it forward for the bit of the time series, the post-COVID, time period that we haven't looked at so far. So the, the, the black line there is the observed data. Uh, and then we've got our uh, forecasts. Uh, the purple line shows the point, the point forecasts. Uh, the dark purple band shows 80% prediction intervals. And the light purple band is our 95% prediction intervals. Um, so yeah, I'm not quite as good at visualization as Cara is, uh, but my chart has purple on it, so that's a start. Um, next, we're going to uh, 
compare our forecasts with what we actually observed and see what we can learn. Uh, so you can see in this chart here, uh, the pink line is what was actually observed, the real sickness absence rates uh, from the start of the pandemic to fairly recently. Um, and the uh, blue line is the, um, the point forecast of our forecasts uh, from our model. Uh, and what you can see happening here is, you know, um, during the first two waves of COVID-19, April 2020 and January 21, um, observed sickness absence rates greatly exceeded uh, forecast. Right? And, and between the waves, so these points here and here, um, you see the observed rate fall back down to forecast. Um, and you see that as well, uh, just after the second wave. Uh, but then at this point here, something changes again. And this is when, um, you know, social restrictions were removed in mid 2021. Uh, we started living with COVID. Uh, and you can see that the observed sickness absence increases again and remains higher than forecast for the rest of the time series. Um, and 2022 has seen more frequent waves occurring every roughly 12 to 15 weeks. Uh, and this was used to successfully forecast the recent October wave, which is outside of the, uh, the time period for this, these data. So I hope I've shown you there how um, you can use forecasts to um, learn something useful uh, about uh, a time series. Um, in this case, we were using it to understand the impact of COVID-19 on NHS staff sickness and to improve forecasts of, of sickness absence rates. Um, but you can actually use this, this, this technique uh, for a wide variety of different um, data, different data sets, uh, different topics, wherever basically you've got a change uh, and you want to understand the impact of that change on time series data, you could potentially use this technique. Um, so, for example, the observed impact of an intervention can be compared with a, a forecast of what could have happened if the intervention hadn't been made. Um, so there you go. I hope you find that useful. Um, please do contact me if you want to know more about this technique. Uh, if you want the R code, uh, following Colin's talk, I might need to make some small changes before sending it on. But uh, yeah, um, please do get in touch if you're interested or if you're here in person, do come and grab me for a chat. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much, Nathan. <laughs> do you have a minute for a question? Do we have any burning questions in the room? Rattle through that very quickly. So. Oh, got one over there. Go on. Hi. Let me bring the mic over for you. That was pretty interesting, actually. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, you said you looked at uh, NHS staff in acute trusts, so acute providers for that. Have you done a similar analysis looking at staff that maybe are more office based in like ICBs or NHS England? It'd be interesting to see how they compare. <laughs> That, that, that's a good question. Yeah, thank you. So we looked at secondary care. So that was acute community mental health. Uh, so yeah, these were people working in providers. Uh, we didn't look uh, at um, ICBs, CCGs, anybody, anybody like that. Um, one thing I should mention, potential limitation of this technique is that you do need quite large numbers to get accurate models. Um, so we were able to do it at uh, regional level, ICB level, um, in terms of, you know, providers within I ICSs, um, and we're able to do it by staff group as well. But once we started doing staff groups within ICSs, then things started to get a bit kind of wonky and our models weren't uh, as accurate as we'd like. Um, so yeah, I, as with anything, uh, central limit theorem applies, you know, you, you need, uh, the larger the numbers, the more trustworthy your model's going to be. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let's thank Nathan again. Thank you.
For those of you who are interested in those techniques, things like the exponential smoothing, um, we were privileged a year or two ago to have um, uh, Dr. Batman and Rustami Tabo write as a course for NHS Art. So we do have a set of material on those methods. I'll see if we can get that added to Slack and uh, point people in the direction of that. Um, but I'll welcome our next speaker, Verla. Do come up, please. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Verla, and today I'm going to talk about using Plumber to share data across or between organizations. Plumber is an R package uh, that is being used to build APIs. So today I'm going to tell you more about what an API is and how you can use it and what the potential benefits are of using it in your work. But first, so you know who's in front of you, a uh, little bit of an introduction. So as I said, my name is Everle and I'm Managing Director and Head of Data Science at Analytic Health. At Analytic Health, we help companies to access and analyze pharmaceutical data. So we gather pharmaceutical data from the NHS and other organizations, think about prescribing data, think about shortage data, uh, drug tariff prices, and we make them accessible to organizations. We do that so that these companies can focus on what matters, namely developing new medicines and doing other things to accelerate innovation in healthcare. So in order to achieve this, we have built places where we gather all this data together and that people can easily access them. So we have two applications, both are written in R. We have Shiny applications and one Shiny application that comes with a Plumber API about which I'm talking today. I'm not doing that alone, I'm doing that with a core team of three people. Um, it's myself, it's my business partner Greg, who is somewhere in the audience as well today, and with our head of operations, Jana, and we are supported by a small team of our developers who help us out with the app as well. All right, back to Plumber then. So an API is an application programming interface, and what it actually does it defines a set of rules to communicate with other software. Could be any software, think about other computer programs, think about um, Excel sheets or whatever, any type of software can communicate with an API. And an API just sets all the rules that are needed to communicate with it and to retrieve data from it, to retrieve documents from it, etc. So in the case of HTTP APIs, um, which is really what Plumber does, you have a defined set of endpoints and that they accept all a particular input. An API can be best explained by the restaurant analogy. So imagine a restaurant, you have people there ordering uh, and eating, obviously, your food. You have waiters in there and you have a kitchen that prepares the food. So see the customers who order your food as a client, could be a client machine, could be a web browser, could be a server. See the waiter as the API and see the kitchen as a server. So the place where the food gets prepared and where the chef make all the delicious things to get to the clients in the end. So an API takes requests and obviously delivers responses in return. So what you do when you order your food, you go to the waiter, you say, hey, give me a steak. Then the waiter goes to the kitchen and says, yo, this guy likes a steak. And then what the kitchen does, it prepares the steak and returns it with, obviously, the waiter um, to the client's their table. All right, now imagine that you're the chef and you need to run around yourself, so there's no waiter. And yesterday we heard all about um, creating reproducible analytical um, workflows and not repeating yourself and making things all automated. And that's great, and that's a great effort, but how do you get all that automated stuff easily to the people who are going to use it? So you can have your kitchen prepped all you want, and you can do all the preparation um, to begin with, like cutting, cutting the vegetables and like preparing all kinds of stuff already, but you still need to bring it there. And if you are running, if you are the chef, and you are running constantly to your clients, it's actually not that efficient. And I have more advantages about an API, six of them. So starting with the first one, with an API, you can easily communicate, meaning that it's very easy for you to communicate with third parties. 
Think about third parties as your colleagues, think about other organizations, think about other service providers, etc. An API is just a simple HTTP API that can handle requests and return responses. It doesn't depend on programming language. You can write APIs in R, because I'm here for that today, but you can also write APIs in Python, in any other language you can think of, um, and any, any other language can consume an API as well. So it doesn't matter in what language the API was written, it doesn't matter in, with, in what language you want to process the data, it's language agnostic. So that's one advantage, better communication between systems. That also touches upon point two, integration. And as we all know, and that I heard a lot yesterday as well, we work in these big systems, big organizations that actually should be able to all talk with each other, um, but all systems are kind of sometimes closed or have legacy systems in place. An API, because it is language agnostic and basically an entity that every software or programming language can work with, it's easy to integrate into existing pipelines. Then also efficiency. As I said, if you have an API, you are not a cook who needs to run uh, from the customers to the kitchen every time, but it also enables you to publish new information, new data um, automatically, and it is available immediately. Meaning an API is a standalone thing on its own. If you push new data to it, or if you have updated your analysis, it's all of a sudden there in your API and your other programs can use it without changing any of their code. That also allows for the fourth advantage, automation. So um, distribution of data or any update that you make is kind of handled with the API. An API is just a separate entity which perfectly allows you to automate it in any pipelines that you may have. Then also customization. If you have your clients and they get your food or whatever, um, or your data or whatever you send to the API, they can do with it whatever they want. So there's a lot of room for customization. Like people can choose how they consume your data, what they do with it, what they build on top of it. Um, so instead of you, needing to cut the food for them or, don't know, put the dressing on top of it, you can let uh, them do it themselves. Then scalability. If your client or your consumers are separated from your real analysis, you have the perfect opportunity to scale it. These are separate things. If you um, want to serve more clients, you can just increase the capacity of the API. So, I hear you, you want to build that, of course. We are all R programmers and we love all this nerdy stuff. So now we want to build our own API and we can do it with R and it's not difficult. We can build APIs with R Plumber. So it's a package built by R Studio, uh, Posit nowadays. And it's super simple because you just have a function as we normally know it, a function in R, and you can put some special comments on top of it. And all of a sudden you have an API endpoint. So if you are used to uh, developing R packages, if you are familiar with that, this kind of documentation style looks familiar to you because it looks very much like Roxygen, only here we have a star. So hashtag star to kind of comment your code. So just as we would normally do in the package, you define your parameters, give it a description, and you see something special here, namely that's the last one where it says um, at get, which means that you give an API endpoint, either a get or a post status. Get just simply means that you can get um, information through a URL just by kind of manipulating that string as that we normally do when we work with web, web data. Post means that you can actually give it a body of information so you can give it a sub data set or parameter that you want. But that's actually only the special thing to it, but building an API in Plumber, and that is that last line, namely define a get or a post endpoint and give it a name. So what would happen in this case, if I gave it slash echo, I would go to a website slash echo, and I would say, because there's a parameter, let's say message in here, I would say slash echo, then a question mark, message is hello, and then my API will return a message. This is a very probably useless API, but you get the point. 
And now, obviously, when we're talking about APIs a lot, we think about big JSON files with a lot of data and looks boring and, you know, it's only shifting data from one place to another. But we can also return plots and documents with an API. And that's not more difficult than returning data or a message. In this case, in this example, we return a plot um, simply by specializing here the, the last line is at serializer where you just say, no, don't return the standard JSON format, just return a PNG, um, and this will give you a nice image in return. So think about use cases as an analysis where you keep um, making a, a report with a plot in it, and you update all the data that's behind that plot, for example. You can simply, in that report, make an API call instead, so that you don't have to worry about when you update the one, uh, the data in one place that you need to update at, at the other. Okay, so then you have your API, um, you build it, you need to share it with the world, you need to host it somewhere because obviously somebody is going to a website, a URL, um, where, you, where you're going to ask for your data. So there are multiple ways to do that, uh, one is not better than the other, just different solutions. One solution is Posit, Posit Connect, uh, where you can host Python, uh, our APIs on, um, but then we also have solutions like Docker and DigitalOcean, um, which allow you to kind of publish the API also on AWS or Azure or any other system that your organization might have. If your system does do, uh, if your organization does do anything with cloud at all, I'm pretty sure that they can publish an API as well. And this then eventually looks like this. You have your URL, you have your um, API slash echo, you have your message, and then we will simply return the message. So what could it look like in real life? Pretty quickly with a real life example of how we do it, we have an API uh, called from the Cloud Data API built in Plumber. That Plumber consumes kind of data from our data warehouses, from our servers. Um, and then we have clients that all make use of that API. And that could be different things. That's the beauty of it. So we can have our Markdown reports, we can have Shiny applications, we can have Excel workbooks if you want to do old school. Um, we can have customer databases that directly query that API for information and that basically connects them directly with our database. So depending on the choice of preference of the client, they can choose uh, to do whatever they want. And then uh, another good benefit is that you can put a monitor or something that monitors the API because it's a separate thing, a separate analysis, a separate process. You can um, put a monitor on it so that everybody knows that the information that is produced there is always correct. Postman is a way to do that, but there are other ways as well. Okay, I don't think there are any time for questions. If there are any, uh, come find us at the lunch in an hour um, or connect with me on LinkedIn or check out the website. And then I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. We do, as a matter of fact, have a minute or so for a question. If anyone has any questions. Looks like a no from the room here, but I, I would say I think the use of APIs is something that maybe our analytical community is a little bit newer to. We don't see so much of that, so it's fantastic to see an example of that in use and how it can be put, uh, put into practice. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we show our appreciation. Thank you. And uh, I'll welcome our next speakers, Santosh and Yehan. Hello everyone. So today I will be presenting this research with my colleague Santosh. So my name is Ihan. I am a health economist from the Health Economics Unit. And maybe, yes, yeah, Santosh, a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Santosh Kumar and I'm a lead data scientist at Health Economy Unit. Yeah, so I will cover the introduction and the conclusion part where Santosh will cover the methodology. So I know in half an hour's time, you're gonna have the lunch break. During lunch break, you'll probably check your phone and when you check your phone, you're probably going to see the headline today, which is about the Alton Statement by Jeremy Hunt. So what we will be caring about, we'll be caring about the public funding for healthcare. We want to know, oh, will we have enough money to support the, our um, healthcare in the coming years? So our research is really relevant to that, as we will be introducing to you 
a research that we try to do to understand uh, aging patterns is the case study in Northwest London. So let's go straight to it. So why we care about we may not have enough money because we know that we are entering an aging society like the rest of the developed world. And as we age, we have more morbidity. And as we have more morbidity, we have more health needs. And if we have more health needs, obviously we need more public funding for healthcare. However, is that always true? The logic chain sounds super solid, but a recent study uh, by the Rio Center suggests it might not be the case. So they found out that increased longevity alone may not necessarily translate to more lifelong, um, higher li lifetime healthcare needs. Why? Because what it really matters is the trajectory of the morbidity. So what does it really like? Um, there are actually three competing hypotheses about it. So if you look at the baseline scenario A, which is about maybe 50 years ago, when people started to experience ill health about around age 60, and their health deteriorated and they die at age 70. And we know things have improved tremendously now. But what does it really look like? There are different scenarios. If we look at scenario B, which is what the mobility expansion theory argues, which is also probably the assumptions we all buy in, is that, okay, people still start to experience ill health around age 60, but they uh, live much longer. They die at 80. So we are seeing a larger proportion of people's lifetime spent in ill health, and then obviously we will experience more healthcare needs. However, the mobility com compression theory argues the opposite. So if you look at figure C, they argue that people start to experience EU health at a later stage. So say at 69, and they die around 80. So that means people actually uh, spend a smaller proportion of their lifetime in EU health, which is, sounds very hopeful, which means we might not need as much healthcare funding as we thought. The third theory is called the dynamic uh, equilibrium theory. It's something in between. So it argues that, oh, people probably still start to experience the long-term conditions around 60, but in a milder form. So even if they're dying at 80 overall, uh, the care, healthcare needs might be like similar to what we experienced before. So what does it really look like in London? We check the international like literature, the evidence is mixed. Some support the uh, compression theory, some supports the expansion theory. So our research question is actually to find out what are the general patterns of aging, uh, which we define as the onset of more than two long-term conditions look like in Northwest London. And we also want to know whether the patterns are different by gender, ethnicity, and deprivation. So now I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Santosh, to explain the methodology we use. Thank you. So about the methodology, first we are going for the data source. So we consider Northwest London data in which we have a very large linked longitudinal data and we have like 80, around 80,000 unique patient and those unique patient have like multiple entry into the system according to their progression of the long-term conditions. So in total uh, number of uh, entries, then we got like around uh, 3,094 uh, 3, uh, entries are there. And we analyze especially for those patients who has a uh, age above uh, age 65 or above. And the time period we consider is like 1st of January 2015 uh, to 31st of December 2021. And in this data set, we have uh, key variables. For example, we have a long-term conditions. So the long-term conditions uh, we got is like total number of long-term conditions were like 13. And we have like then the patient demographic information, for example, their age, their gender, their ethnicity, and their IMD decile. And then we have a year of age. So the year of age is when the patient is entering into the system. 
And this is like more characteristics about uh, the data we have. So as, we, as, as I mentioned, we have a data from 2015 to 2021. So you can see here like the largely diverse population we have for uh, 2015, which is the uh, largest number of the population also in terms of the years. And in that particular cohort for 2015, we have an age range of the patient from 65 to 90, and then subsequent cohort from 2016 to 2021, we have just age from 65 to 67. And we also analyzed like the over the year, uh, the, sex the sex ratio and the av average age remained quite stable. And then what, uh, this is the methodology for, we have done for an, as an analytic approach. So we have applied the survival analysis. Why we applied the survival analysis? Because we have a longitudinal data where we have an event and then we have a time. So in this particular survival analysis is, uh, maybe you know already about the survival analysis. The survival analysis is about time to event analysis. And I can give you a classic example of survival analysis. So uh, suppose you got this uh, pain in your tooth and the next day you visited to doctor and the doctor extracted the tooth and then he say like they, they have to fill some uh, material uh, into your tooth. So the doctor want to, anal uh, the dentist want to analyze the quality of the material over the time. So this is how he can analyze like for, for maybe some people that filling is gonna long lasting for two years, for few people it's long lasting for three years, for, uh, for, for next people like for six years. So if they want to analyze the quality of their filling, how much is gonna survive on the patient, then they have to do this kind of survival analysis. So in, uh, our, in our particular scenario, we have an event occur. So the event is here, the long-term conditions and the event we, uh, we, we convert it as a binary variable. So people who has a like two or more long-term conditions, we are giving zero, otherwise we are giving uh, uh, one. So the study is out of time uh, at the end of 2021 and the patient lost the follow-up. Maybe they can die or maybe uh, they simply uh, uh, get out from uh, the, the system. So uh, there are the few steps to implement your uh, survival analysis. The first step is we have to define the event, time, and censoring. So in our case, the event, as I mentioned, is the long-term conditions, whether people have like two or two plus long-term condition or not. And then in the uh, time is the age of, uh, year of a patient who enter into the system. So that can be like for some patient 2015, on the other patient, it can be 2016, and so on till the 2021. And then once uh, you define your time and event, the next very important part is to define your censoring. So the censoring is something where you have missing information about the patient. So this missing information is how you're gonna fill. So this missing information can be like patient is die before uh, the event happened, or patient simply exit from the system, uh, before the event happens. So this kind of uh, missing information we consider as a censoring in uh, survival analysis. In particular, our analysis, uh, we, con we consider as a uh, right censoring method. Uh, and then once you define event time and censoring, the next step to estimate your survival hazard or the survival function, and then compare the function between two or more groups. Uh, basic, uh, in our case, we are comparing uh, between the different age and different ethnicity and different groups. So uh, you can uh, do the two things. One, you can calculate the survival function. So basically the survival function is an probability to event happening sometime after a time point. And then you have a hazard function where you can calculate the instances uh, risk of having event giving the patient is still at a risk. So there is a more, one more example you can understand way, uh, more better how the survival analysis is work. So if you look at the uh, right hand plot, then this is, uh, this is the plot for the Boris Johnson prime ministership where uh, the, the time when a uh, lot of uh, rejuvenations were there. So you can see here at, at top most 46 uh, minister resigns under his prime ministership. So 
the, sub, the number of uh, uh, resign is a time of interest and then uh, the number of year of prime ministership for Boris Johnson is here a time to event. But this is still very unclear to understand what happening. But if you look at the left hand plot, then you have a y axis where is the probability of remaining the prime minister and you have a x axis where you have a number of year of his prime minister. So at the very first year, he has a 100% survival rate, but when he admitted to the ICU, his survival rate probably got down by, and it's only 90%. Then party gate happened, and then no uh, confidence vote happened, and then uh, Rishi Sunak and Zabad is resigned, and then suddenly his uh, survival chance gets zero. So this is how you can do the survival analysis, and the same methodology we use for our analysis. To, to determine the long-term condition for, for the people. And now, the, our finding is going to discuss by Ihan, please. Thank you, Santosh. So, as Santosh just explained, we wanted to use the example to really illustrate what a survival analysis looks like. So, in our case, the outcome is like long-term, we, we kind of want to depict the relationship between the number of long-term conditions and whether people can how long they can survive so that's why we use the example and just to briefly recap what the y-axis represents here it represents the hazard of survival so the survival here means people having less than two long-term conditions and the y the x-axis represents the follow-up years as we mentioned our study had seven years of follow-up so just the first is the headline results. What did we find in, the, in general? So in general, as you can see, if we trace from the year from one to seven, obviously the survival rate uh, is gonna drop as people age and experience more long-term conditions. However, the pattern is quite interesting. It follows this gradual and then sudden drop. So it's not happening in a linear fashion. People are not aging uh, in a like, gradual stable pace it's like they actually even they are above 65 they're actually quite healthy not having a lot of long-term conditions until like at a critical point their health suddenly deteriorated so here's our like this connected to our first research question and second is how does it differ by different characteristics? So we have the full results and the manuscript that we're preparing here is just a selection of the key headline results. So perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, we find that people who are like in a, like who are older, who uh, like have higher risk, and also people who are Asian and who are black, they tend to also have higher risk of uh, of having more than to long-term conditions. What is quite surprising is we actually didn't find a very significant gender effect here. So men and women actually, after controlling for other factors, uh, their, their aging speed actually didn't differ too much. And obviously, uh, the deprivation level, it's an area-based um, variable, so it's not individual level. That's why the effect size we observed is like smaller compared to the other variables, but they are nevertheless um, show the health inequality that people lived in the more deprived areas actually uh, experienced a higher risk. So what we can take away from all the findings that we know the patterns, they follow the gradual and sudden, we know some groups are more prone to the risk than compared to others. So the overall recommendation actually we think we can take from the study is first, we can go back to the initial three scenarios that I presented earlier. So what the findings really suggest is like the trajectory might not follow the fixed patterns that the previous researcher they said. It could be as uh, like what we may suggest is actually scenario E where people like even if they're old they experience relatively good health until like after critical age their health deteriorated and what we can learn from this is that if we were to model health expenditure health care needs we may consider this non-linear relationship uh, and secondly as we also have have found the differences by different characteristics 
we may actually realize there is no single trajectory that fits all the different population. As our colleague Andy previously presented, we probably need to do the uh, population segmentation, risk stratification. So maybe we, there is a trajectory for different risk groups. And by identifying the critical point for different groups, we can actually uh, design and target the pre prevent preventative measures to help those people. And obviously our research is not without limitations. So one limitation is that the data set we have is from the Northwest London, even though it's a relatively large data set, it, we only had like follow up years of seven. So ideally we would like to replicate the study uh, with a bigger data set with more follow up years. And second is that we are aware that the number of long-term conditions is a good, but not always super reliable indicator of people's health. Like because people who are more self, like, like they're more health conscious may, uh, may like diagnose their conditions earlier. So it, in some ironic cases, people with more conditions might actually healthier. But in general, uh, we believe there is a quite good relationship between health level and long -term number of long-term conditions. So that's our presentation. Um, I hope there is, uh, yeah, we're probably- Thank you so much. I think we're gonna have to finish there and take no questions <laughs> yeah. at this point. Thank you, that's fantastic. It's a great example of a piece of work. That it's also the first time I've ever seen survival analysis explained through the medium of British politics, which I thought was great. Um, as uh, NHSR community over the last few years, we've received a lot of support um, from uh, the wonderful company called Posit, who some of you may know as our studio. They've uh, recently, I'm sure uh, my colleague Ryan will say more in a second, recently pivoted and changed their name. But I'm sure all of us already use a lot of their products. We probably extensively use our studio IDE. We probably uh, all use many of the packages they uh, create and maintain, including Tidyverse. So I'll hand over to Ryan. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so like I mentioned, my name is Ryan Johnson. I'm a customer success manager at Posit, the company formerly known as our studio. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our product updates. So I'll touch upon both our open source and some of our professional tools as well. But just as a, a quick poll of the audience, so maybe a show of hands, how many have ever used the RStudio IDE before? Good, that's what I was hoping to see. I guess the better question is who hasn't used the RStudio ID before? Ah, oh, even better response, great. This is really exciting. Um, the RStudio IDE is still to date our most popular tool and most importantly, it is absolutely free. This is something we believe very heavily at Posit and no matter who you are, you should have access to tools like this to do data science. As long as you have a computer, as long as you have internet access, you can do data science. Now, the RStudio IDE was designed for the individual user, so all of you in the audience, whether you're doing R code or Python code as well. There's another package I'm sure some of you have heard of called Reticulate, which allows you to do a lot of great Python work directly within the RStudio IDE. But one of the questions becomes, what about data science teams? So you have larger data science teams, such as yourselves. And when you're working on a team, what tends to happen sometimes is everybody has their own laptop, either their work laptop or a personal laptop, and they're all working in their own kind of siloed environment using the open source RStudio IDE, which is fine, but you may have different versions of the RStudio IDE, you may have different operating systems, different system dependencies, and this can be a bit of a nightmare, especially when you're trying to share code with your colleagues. Or, you know, from your system administrator's perspective, trying to manage all these separate environments is a bit of a nightmare. So this brings us to our first professional tool that some of you may have heard of before, and this is known as Posit Workbench. And really the take home here is that it centralizes your computer environment. So you can access the RStudio IDE. You can also access some other IDEs as well. So if you're a fan of Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, and our most recent integration was VS Code, which is really meant to be an all-purpose editor. And you can deploy Posit Workbench in whatever environment your team is most comfortable with. You can have it on a Linux server, you know, on-prem behind your network, behind your firewall. You can deploy to the cloud, AWS, GCP, Azure. We also recently launched some hosted environments as well. So if your team uses Amazon SageMaker or Azure ML, you can also deploy Posit Workbench. 
Now, for everyone here in the room, you're probably going to use the RStudio IDE or potentially some of these other IDEs to create content. All right, and that content, content can be a variety of forms. You could have static content. We talked about a lot of these during the last day and a half. Our Markdown, maybe some of you have heard of Pins, Jupyter Notebooks. There's one additional tool that uh, we're really excited about. I just wanted to spend a few seconds talking about, and that's Quarto. I saw plenty of people actually created their slides for th this talk uh, using Quarto. I did not. Um, but just to spend a little bit of time about Quarto, what is it? First and foremost, it is free, and probably the best way to think about it, it's like our Markdown 2.0, all right? And for a lot of the folks in the audience that are working on scientific and technical publishing, this tool is really designed for you. And some of the benefits include that it's language agnostic, you can use it with R, you can use Python, you can use Julia, Observable, and you can use whatever IDE you want. You can use the RStudio ID, you can use VS Code, Jupyter, or some other text editor to create a Quarto document. So it's a really powerful tool and we're really excited about it. And again, it's free, try it out and let us know how you like it. So in addition to static content, your data scientists, your analysts could be creating applications. I'm sure most folks here have heard of Shiny, which is a framework for creating those web applications using R. There's a lot of other great frameworks in the Python ecosystem to create uh, web applications like I'm showing right here. But I wanted to emphasize one really exciting thing pertaining to Shiny, is that for the past decade now, so Shiny has been around for almost exactly a decade, it's really been a tool for our developers. But recently, as of last July, we actually announced that for Python developers, there's a Shiny framework for creating Shiny applications. And so in this slide right here, where I'm showing on the left-hand side, that is Python code. And when you render it, you get a Shiny application, something that looks very similar to a typical Shiny application you would see with R. This is still an alpha, so we're really encouraging folks to try it out and let us know what you think so we can make it better. Uh, but we're really excited about Shiny for Python. And then finally, you can also create APIs, just like we heard a few talks ago, using a plumber package for those APIs using R, and there's a lot of other ways to create APIs like Flask and Fast API for Python as well. Now, when your analysts have created this content, it doesn't do anyone any good if you can't share that content with the people who need to see it. All right, this could be your hospitals, it could be your boss, it could be your friends and family if you're something really proud of. So the question becomes, how do you get it from their hands into the hands of people that need to see it? And that brings us to our second professional tool, so a tool that has been mentioned a few times, and this is known as Posit Connect. And what it allows your data scientists and analysts to do is to publish all this content that they're creating that I'm showing down here to the Connect server. And that way your end users can log into the Connect server and can view that content and they don't have to know anything about R, Python, RStudio, Posit. They can just treat it like any other website. So again, this could be your colleagues, business leaders, customers you're working with, or potentially you're gonna design something you wanna open up to the entire world. You can do that with Posit Connect. Now the data scientists, when they're working in, within Workbench and they're publishing to connect, ultimately they're going to be using packages. We've talked about a ton of packages during this conference. You know, we obviously love packages here at Posit. There's a bunch of hex stickers still in the other room that we need to get rid of, so please go and take those. Um, but we've developed plenty of packages in-house at Posit. Uh, there's a lot of great packages in the Python ecosystem as well. And when you go to install a package, typically you're gonna be pulling it from some repository. Now with an R, you've probably heard of CRAN, Bioconductor, for Python packages, you have PyPI, or potentially something you're working on or a development version of a package, something that hosted on GitHub. And so when you have all these packages, people pulling in from various repositories, potentially pulling in different versions of packages, sometimes packages depend on other packages, it can get pretty messy pretty fast. And so that brings us to our third and last professional tool, something known as Posit Package Manager. And it does basically, as this name kind of says, it helps manage all of those packages that your team's working on. You can create your own repositories if you want, so like a subset of CRAN packages. It also helps manage some of those system dependencies, which can be a real pain in the butt to, to get over. So those are our three professional tools. Uh, when you bundle all three of these together, so Workbench Connect and Package Manager, it's something known as Posit team. 
And if you want to learn more about Pod's team, myself, we've been sitting in the back in the kind of the far right corner. Uh, and also my colleague Lauren Chadwick is also here. You can come check us out at the table at the next break. We'd be more than happy to talk about Pod's team. Also, just go ahead and snag our emails. They're, they're brand new email addresses. So uh, just it's our first name at posit.co. We'd love to chat with you. Um, but if you want to learn more about data science in general, there's two additional tools I just want to quickly highlight before I wrap things up. And that's Posit Academy and Posit Cloud. So what is Posit Academy? This is a relatively new training initiative that we started maybe about a year, year and a half ago at this point. And it's actually, it's a really cool way to learn R. So for example, if you have any SaaS developers that are looking to make that migration over to R, this is something that Academy can hopefully help out with. And what we do is we take small groups, so usually about seven or eight individuals. Typically, you're all working on the same team or in the same company, and you get paired with an academy mentor, so someone who has a little bit more expertise in whatever topic you're working on. You, work, you basically kind of work at your own pace. So you meet maybe once or twice a week. But the really cool thing I love about Academy is you work with a tailored curriculum. So you're not working with that typical, you know, empty cars, Star Wars data set. You're actually working with data that you work on a day to day, you know, at your job. So this is something we're really excited about. And again, if you're just looking for ways to upskill your data scientists with R, uh, Academy could be a good fit for your team. And then the last thing I'll mention here, something I think some folks are familiar with, but if not, Posit Cloud. This is a hosted environment for both our Studio ID as well as Jupyter Notebooks. Now, I think the best way to explain cloud is if you've ever taught R or Python, and you go to sit down for your first session, and you end up spending the entire day just trying to get everyone's laptop up to speed with yours. So installing the right version of R, right version of Python, all those packages, the right version of those packages, and then you pay, pretty much end up wasting an entire day just trying to set up everyone's computer. So what Posit Cloud allows is a hosted environment where you as the educator, the trainer, can set up a customized environment and the learners would just log into that environment. So there's no hardware hassle. Learners can jump right in and start learning immediately. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. Again, just really want to emphasize if you have any questions or want to learn any more about our professional tools or our open source tools like Quarto, Shining for Python, we'd love to chat with you. Again, Lauren and I will be around for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Do we have any quick questions for Ryan at all? I can't see any hands. That's no problem. So if you do have any questions, do go and see them. They have, uh, Lauren and Ryan both have a stand over in uh, the refreshment area. I believe our next speaker is one of your colleagues, but it's via video. So welcome uh, to Reef via his video. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for hosting me today. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person to talk to you live. My, uh, my name is Tariq Waugh, I'm the president of our studio, and, um, and I was asked by Mohammed Mohammed to actually give you guys a little bit of an insight into who we are, how we, what is our philosophy, our business philosophy as a company, uh, how we approach the world, and so on. So uh, my, my journey with our studio uh, started about almost 10 years ago when JJ and I met for coffee uh, to be at, uh, at a little diner in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, our goal was to get to know another. I assumed that he wanted me to join as a as a head of engineering, and, uh, and before you know, we were having a deep conversation about company building. What does it mean to have? Uh, you know, what is the purpose of an organization, and what are you trying to do uh, with it? Right, and, uh, and sort of the ills of uh, uh, certain types of investment strategies, and, and sort of the approach that's taken by corporate uh, America in general, and. Uh, the uh, after two and a half hours it became very clear that he and I shared our uh, uh, shared very common views of what it meant to build a company that uh, could add a tremendous amount of value in the world. JJ is an entrepreneur um, who has it is very well known is very well known in the Boston area in particular. Uh, he created something called uh, Cold Fusion as part of the LR Corporation that you know went public and then sold to Macromedia, which then got bought by Adobe. Uh, he then built another app uh, that became, uh, you know, Windows Live Writer as part, part of Microsoft acquisition. He then decided to teach himself iOS development, built an app, became the number one health and fitness app called Lose It for weight loss. 
And then he basically founded our studio because he wanted to give something back to society. And so uh, when Jaden and I met, he's like, I want to build this kind of company. And I'm like, I love that, but I don't know if we can pull that off. And we talked about how would you do something like this? And so what we decided to do is uh, uh, to raise a round of funding and to be very upfront with the investors and say, what we're trying to do is build a company that can be profitable um, and uh, they can continue to contribute to open source uh, software. And so we did in May of that, in 2013, we raised around funding. We started building a product, uh, product that we could sell to the commercial um, uh, enterprise. And, uh, and our thinking here was that if we took our open source products and we added capabilities around security, authentication, monitoring, tuning, metrics, collaboration, scale, and uh, mm -hmm. having a commercial license and support, that that would be an attractive uh, package, particularly if you priced it fairly. Uh, and so we uh, started selling those products and, uh, and thanks to customers such as yourselves, we've been able to sort of scale that business uh, to five people when I joined about almost 10 years ago to about 330 people today. Um, we, uh, we started off being distributed um, and, uh, and that has proved to be a very good thing, decision for us as an organization. In 2020, we, uh, we announced that we uh, became a public benefit corporation. And a public benefit corporation is uh, similar to a for-profit uh, uh, um, organization with some key important differences. So unlike um, a pure um, profit-only driven organization, we as directors are not only meant to sort of optimize the shareholder value, but we actually have to take into consideration the, the needs of our uh, community, our customers, our employees, obviously the shareholders, the, uh, the environment, and, and our public benefit good. So for us, the public benefit good that we specify is really about open source data science and uh, scientific publishing. Uh, you'll probably notice by the time we talk today that, um, that we have rebranded our company from our studio to Posit. Um, and so people ask me, why did you guys do that? And, and so the, the analogy that I came out with in February of this year, after many years, and so JJ and I have been talking for about three to four years with our marketing team about potentially rebranding the company, but we never could make the argument well enough uh, to explain why we needed to do this. But, uh, but the argument was really simple, right? Um, imagine you have a, a steakhouse in, in town that makes the best steaks, um, and, uh, and it's called the steakhouse. And now you try to convince people that you have a fantastic vegan menu as well. And it turns out that's very hard to do. The only way vegans will go into that restaurant is if their friends uh, drag them in, um, tell them, listen, I swear they have different pots and pans and fryers or whatnot that will allow you to keep these two uh, uh, diametrically opposed uh, uh, things away from each other. So uh, our studio, the brand, is very, very much coupled to R, and, uh, and that made it very difficult for Python-only teams or Python teams in general to believe that our commercial products uh, can be used in that way. And so even though we had been building products for three or four years that could be used by Python teams and were used by Python teams, we always had to enter in through the door uh, of the R users, if you will. So, posit, posit is a word an English word um, that we think actually represents the work that you all do with the tools that that you know we're all happy to be contributing to and using to sort of answer the questions about the world around us. And so uh, it's about being able to make a hypothesis, being able to sort of test it out and confirm whether you got it right or whether you got it wrong. Right. Um, I highly encourage you to watch JJ and Hadley's keynote from our 2022 conference um, in Ireland this year which sort of gives you a little bit deeper background into why, uh, why posit and why we're excited about that. Um, as I mentioned, this is a clear, this is a, it's, it's a real word in the English language. We, uh, we think it's more inclusive to what people are likely to be doing with data science and, and advanced analytics uh, over the coming hundred years, right? So our goal is to build a company that can be around for a hundred years which means that um, it has to be an umbrella that's wide enough to fit the, the various trends that are likely to happen over the coming years. So 
core to our philosophy from day one was this idea that we wanted to be contributing free and open source software. We give away our software uh, to, to the world. Our hope is that data scientists and data analysts take them into their organizations. And as their organizations start using them in earnest in production environments, they find themselves needing capabilities that are in our commercial products. They look at our products and they see that they're fairly priced. That allows them to sort of buy and convince their uh, finance organizations that they should invest in these tools, um, both because that provides value right now, but also in supporting the organization that is helping build, build and, and maintain these tools longer term. Uh, and that purchase of the software, um, we, we sort of call the virtuous cycle, right? The more software general revenue we generate, the more we're able to invest. And that continues over time that allows us to, to invest in, in bigger ways. Um, our, we've been driven by these three core philosophies. So code first, which means that we are not going to be big into drag and drop point click solutions. At the end of the day, we think everything should be in code so that it's inspectable, repeatable, uh, and it's transparent for folks. Um, we think that that also, by, by, by making it open source, you have the power of leveraging other people's work and learning and confirming that the work that they're doing is, is done in the, in the right way. Um, but then ultimately also to make sure that the commercial products that you buy allow you to run at scale. So what does a data science team do in our view? They, you are um, inspecting the data, whether you're using R or you're using Python, you're building applications, reports, models, uh, various APIs, et cetera. Uh, and then ultimately you want to be able to share that insight. Right? So data science without sharing um, is not all that useful, right? What you really want is to be able to make better decisions off of the, off of the data that you have, right? And underlying all of this, obviously, is the, is, are the packages that you're using uh, to come up with these insights, right? Um, and, uh, and the decision makers are consuming this work either as dashboards, interactive web applications, uh, scheduled emails, uh, or APIs that may be leveraged by other machines in the organization. For us, that basically means those translate the three key products uh, into the on-premise uh, side of the world. So, Posit Workbench, where all the all the, all the authoring work, Posit Package Manager, for uh, figuring out what you're know, being able to control, what packages you have running behind your firewall, and finally Posit Connect for the publishing of that work. We also have something called a uh, Posit Cloud, which gives you sort of a uh, no installation uh, solution that for folks who are okay with their data leaving their firewalls uh, and, and running within um, you know, AWS, that you know, in a multi-handed environment that we run. So you'll see these are the three products as part of the Posit team. And as I mentioned, those, those three products will also be available in Posit Cloud. Uh, and then we've introduced this new thing called Posit Academy last year. And the idea here is to, to take the, the concept of apprenticeship and uh, make turnkey data science uh, available to, the, to, to folks who are interested within organizations to take problems that they're working on and work for an extended period of time uh, with, with mentors on uh, getting deeper into how you can use these tools to solve your problems. Uh, finally, in terms of where we're going, our, you'll see releases from us over the coming weeks uh, with the re full rebrand on the product line. We, with the added obviously capabilities and features uh, that you would expect. One of the key goals for us is to make sure that uh, the language that we use, the documentation and the tooling is, remark is, is attractive and useful to uh, folks outside of the R community while we continue sort of our big investments in the R side of the world. I, uh, I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to me today, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to uh, meet with you in person, but hopefully next time uh, we'll be in a better position to answer questions for you, and, uh, and I look forward to hopefully meeting you in the future. Thank you very much for taking the time. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to all of Posit for your engagement with our community and for presenting today. So our final speaker for this session will be a familiar face to many of you. Anastasia has helped uh, shepherd our conferences together over a number of years and many remote conference headaches. Uh, but now she's back to speak to us about her work. Right. 
Thanks, Chris, for such a kind words. Um, yeah, it's great to be back. Uh, great to see people in person and catch up with everyone. Um, and yeah, uh, I used to be analyst uh, and taking um, breaks for uh, doing conference. And now I have to manage analytical projects. So this is what my talk is about. Uh, I'm currently working for economic strategic analysis team in NHS England um, as a senior economic manager. And uh, we as a team work on a project basis. So um, as my colleague Edmund said yesterday, we usually work uh, on projects, a uh, couple projects at the same time. Uh, from three to eight team members, um, and uh, apparently uh, it's uh, uh, coding is, is hard, uh, but uh, magic projects is sometimes even harder. Uh, uh, so as a background, uh, what I mean by project is really any analytical work, uh, which can nicely fit into these three uh, uh, shapes. Uh, you have a question from stakeholder, usually a clinician or manager, uh, you then uh, do the work, uh, some magic, uh, some dashboard, some analysis, regression, and then you present it and um, happy client, happy person, and uh, very interesting findings. Um, in real life, uh, quite often you uh, have a question, uh, you scope it, uh, you do the work, you then realize you possibly did not quite the correct question or question changed, you then scope again, the work again, present, uh, being challenged uh, sometimes uh, correctly, sometimes not. Uh, do the work again, scope again, do the work at some point, wrap up, and then year after, uh, and it just faces the same problems again, and you have to pick up uh, and your old code and uh, try to understand what you have done a year ago. Um, That's why uh, the things are not very uh, linear and simple. Uh, this is very non technical slide uh, and not as many technical um, uh, tips and tricks here, and to be very honest with you, um, I, I called it Magic Analytical Project Scenario, but it doesn't have to be R, it can be Python or State or any other software. On the scoping question, uh, just, yeah, uh, there are some. My, my, my thoughts are there, but essentially it's very much like Bake Off Technical Challenge. You think you're going to have very detailed uh, information, uh, but all you get is a uh, Bake Victoria sponge, uh, and uh, uh, you just have to decide yourself what uh, exactly you're baking uh, and how. Um, on the, however, on the last one, on the planning of the work, uh, what I found very challenging is, um, as, as my NHS analysts know as well, uh, we, used to, we use Teams a lot and we use SharePoint a lot. But then we also use R and R Studio and uh, let's say Python or AI software to do modeling. And quite often we do it on servers such as on CDR or UDAL, and then we have all these different documents in different places. So all your kind of project management documents are on SharePoint, and then all your actual analytical code is on R. And what we found very useful and started doing now is to have like everything on GitHub. And actually, R can be used very nicely for project planning. And then a big uh, shout out to my colleague Edmund, who presented yesterday, uh, who introduced me to the magic of doing Gantt charts in, um, in GitHub. Uh, sorry, also on GitHub, in R. And then uh, storing all the documents on GitHub, including technical documentation. Um, if anyone knows about any um, like shiny apps that could do task planner nicely uh, on GitHub, would, uh, please do let me know as well. Um, and then the biggest one, and I guess the most interesting one, is doing the work. Um, so first and foremost, what we all have um, uh, sometimes have to deal with is the changes in the workflow. They have multiple versions of documents. You keep updating your data. You um, naming changes, mapping changes. Uh, so the best way to do it is to don't work in isolated documents and work in our, uh, in our project instead. And like ideally, you have version control on GitHub. But Heather uh, Turner yesterday did brilliant talk about it all. Um, and the next one is when your IT doesn't work. Unfortunately, again, this happens a lot. And if you, uh, like me, blessed with laptop that cannot have any software other than Microsoft, uh, then you will possibly have to work on the CDR, which sometimes overloaded. What we found very helpful is what actually Ryan talked earlier today is our Studio Cloud. Uh, I definitely do not recommend you uh, if you have some sort of uh, very uh, demanding deadline and uh, NCDR crash, I definitely don't recommend to transport all your workflow into our studio, but if you have some standalone simple uh, task you need to do uh, as soon as possible, ideally by 3 p.m. yesterday, uh, then our studio cloud was an absolute saver for us. Uh, then next one on uh, maintaining clear documentation. Uh, so uh, again, as speakers told yesterday, it's so much easier to start on GitHub and then uh, on private repo and then make it public than go the other way around uh, because all the attempts to publish code once you finish the project uh, then takes your time and then it takes time while you work on other projects and just things uh, will less likely be done uh, on time and promptly. 
Um, the next one is the, uh, also something Heather mentioned nicely, and this is very light, uh, high-level, non-technical talk, and Heather had the amazing examples yesterday of namings. Uh, so yeah, make sure you have good file namings, but also variable namings. We have to work with uh, multivariate data sets, uh, lots of, um, yeah, lots of provider characteristics, uh, linking things together, uh, very clear names help you uh, knowing what, what the metric is and having very detailed uh, tech doc with what each metric is also will save, uh, will save you uh, as you go. Um, and I think these are the main, uh, the main kind of things, uh, but the one I am especially passionate about is training and teaching others. Uh, so, as I said, sometimes we have teams of up to eight people, uh, usually about three, four, and usually people are, have different R backgrounds, and there are lots of tips and tricks about uh, doing pair coding. Uh, I know the peer review is one, uh, like a different topic, but pair coding is something we, we do a lot, and if you work with someone who's very new to R, uh, having this extra hour or two hours a week just to go through the code together was great, but even if you are uh, both uh, roughly the same level, uh, there are nice uh, techniques like, for example, one when you uh, code for a bit for like 15 minutes and then next person takes turn and then you take turn again. Uh, so it um, helps you learn some new tricks you haven't used, like I'm very much a diverse person. Uh, my other colleagues are very much data table person people, so it's, it helps you a lot uh, upskill yourself as well, upskill others. And uh, well, last but not least, wrapping up, sounds easier than it is. Uh, so quality assurance, uh, again, was mentioned nicely yesterday, the quality assurance checklist. Uh, do not repeat our mistakes and do not quality assure everything at once unless your project is very small. Uh, so as I said, we tend to work on regression analysis and we tend to work with big data sets, having uh, many, many variables uh, all together. Uh, and, uh, there are a couple of milestones and there are nice places to pause and do quality assurance. Uh, so definitely make it doing the stages, let's say, once you put the data together, uh, check, uh, and then once you do modeling, check, and then once you do some other outputs, check as well. Uh, so the present findings, uh, I think, well, here I'm being very guilty, I did this presentation PowerPoint, but yeah, again, having done things in R centrally uh, will save you so much time on making sure you copy the correct charts over from uh, your workflow to the uh, SharePoint document. Uh, so definitely recommend uh, exploring how you can generate slides in our uh, handover as well, just was briefly mentioned just now. Um, so you will never know when and if you will have to pick up your work again, or if others will have to pick up your work. Uh, so yeah, uh, always work on assumption that uh, you will have to uh, at some point uh, asked about it and uh, make sure the documentation is as clear. So, uh, the question is so clear that if you have to wake up at 3 a.m. Uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on like in, in the next five years being asked about it, you can understand what you wrote. Uh, also, do please share your, if you can, try to share your findings with other wide audience because uh, this conference has been one of the brilliant and greatest examples of it. Uh, I had to work on elastic recovery for a long time, then I realized that there are so many teams out there that did fantastic uh, descriptive event simulation, um, uh, and it would possibly uh, save some duplication of effort, uh, but also even message on Slack or like code on GitHub will help because we all, there are many of us, we don't want to duplicate our time, uh, but also we sometimes work on the very similar questions and sometimes have to do similar things like sort the mapping, uh, CCG to ICB, once they all uh, changed in July. Um, so yeah, do make sure to uh, share if you can. Uh, do the lessons learned session, uh, not necessarily lessons learned in American English or which English, doesn't matter. Um, so discuss what went well and share with others because so many like things I found out from other projects helped me and vice versa. And don't forget to celebrate, uh, for example, at the NHSR conference. Uh, and, for example, while well, having lunch. Uh, so this was my very short lightning talk, uh, not very technical, but I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers this morning. We've had quite a variety of things today. Um, just before, well, I'm not going to keep you from your lunch, but just before you go, um, we're going to start again at 2.15. And for anyone who wants to help support the uh, Our Girls Schools Network project, we do have some mugs at the back for sale. And uh, if you choose to buy one of those, you'll be contributing towards that project. So we'll see you later this afternoon. Thanks. Enjoy your lunch.
Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start our afternoon session. I think there's still a few people uh, finishing up their lunch, but they'll join us shortly. Um, so this is our last session this afternoon. Uh, we've got uh, one of the, the full length talks, and then we're going to go into a series of lightning talks. For the speakers, could I ask that if you haven't made yourselves known to the AV team that you go over and say hello and make sure you uh, know what to do with your mics, please. So uh, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Sam. So hi everybody, my name's Sam. Um, it's a delight to be here. I'm really excited to be able to speak to you all. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself because it might help you understand my talk a bit better. So I'm a paediatrician um, by trades. I do have a bit of a background in mathematics. Um, I did an undergraduate and master's in math before deciding actually I wanted to become a doctor. Um, however, I'm very much not a data scientist. I want to talk to you today about our work looking at paediatric antibiotic use and how we've tried to measure that at our local hospital, um, using as much data as we can, and trying to use a data science approach, but obviously I'm not a data scientist, not, no one in my team are data scientists, so I'm definitely not telling anyone here how to be a data scientist or, or how to use code or improve their code, but just kind of trying to share our experiences, both the things that went well and the things that didn't go well within a, a very much a clinical setting and a clinical problem. Um, my buzzer's not working. Okay, perfect. So, a little bit about the problem. We, what we want to do is we want to try and monitor the levels of antibiotic use in children as accurately, as accurately as we can. We know that how much antibiotics you're using is a really key metric of how well you're doing at um, what we call stewardship, which is essentially the safeguarding of antibiotics, particularly to try and reduce antibiotic resistance, which is a massive global problem. And actually children are unfortunately at one of the highest risk groups for antibiotic resistance and that was shown in the biggest ever publication um, of antibiotic resistance across the world in the GRAM report which was published in the Lancet this year. Um, we also have many issues in paediatrics because the methods that we use to assess antibiotic use in children are very limited um, for a number of reasons as I'll explain and therefore we don't have very many systematic data at all about what antibiotics children are getting um, especially in hospital patients in the UK. And actually hospitalised patients are the highest risk for antibiotic resistance. So what are the big issues with paediatric data? Well firstly most reports don't actually separate data in children from data in adults um, and that's a big problem. So the biggest reports that are published every year in the UK are the, the ESBOR report here um, and that's a report in England on all of the antibiotic use um, in hospitals and, and general practice. And actually, children are very little referenced in that, and most children, um, data in children is completely joined to adult data. And that's a big problem because children are a very different cohort. Um, we also know that primary care in the UK are way, way ahead of secondary care. So um, most GP prescriptions are automated and electronic, which means that everything is collected immediately. Um, all the data is, is very easy to analyse and it's centrally collected. We don't have that in secondary care, so we really don't know what's going on in terms of what antibiotics children are getting. Thirdly, we don't use good metrics for children um, for monitoring antibiotic use because most of them are related to dose and specifically a metric which relies on the average adult dose of a drug, which is fine in adults and, and works pretty well, but my patients range from 0 days old to 16 years old and that from the smallest is half a kilo to a kilo up to a 70, 80 kilo, kilo 15, 16 year old. So dose related metrics really don't work, so we need to use better metrics and finally, most data in hospital is taken from dispensary data, so data that in terms of what antibiotics leave the pharmacy, or point prevalence surveys, which are very rudimentary. You look at a series of drug charts over a short period of time, and you do that in a regular, regular intervals, and you take a snapshot of what's happening. But you're excluding all of the other data that's being generated all the time. And in terms of interpreting trends in paediatric data, because they make up quite a small proportion of all the patients in the hospital, there's high variability, so you need as much data as you possibly can to understand trends and changes over time. So what, we, what we've done in Oxford is we, we had the realisation that a lot of people have that electronic prescribing gives you all of the data that you need because it records every single administration of an antibiotic to a child. Um, and it's incredibly rich, but we're not using it at all. And almost no one in the country is using this data. 
Um, we have done a research project at Great Ormond Streets where um, we, we tried to use the data as, as much as we could to solve a number of different problems. And we, we found that it was just vastly more useful. It's much more granular. There's a lot more of the data. Um, you can adjust for many more things from a statistical point of view, so you can do a lot more robust analyses. Um, and you can also use pediatric appropriate metrics, which count the amount of antibiotics people are on on a specific day rather than by dose. And we've actually compared these metrics and shown that if you use the electronic prescribing data and you use the appropriate metric, you get much more reliable, robust results. So in Oxford, we wanted to replicate this, but not as a research project, but more as a clinical tool that our infectious disease team could use to try and improve the antibiotics that we're giving to our children and reduce the harm from them. And um, specifically, we wanted to try and present the data in a really flexible and interpretable format so that the people, the end users, the clinicians, the pharmacists that try and do all of this on a daily basis um, can actually use it and interpret the data. So as an example of, of why the continuous data that we can get from electronic prescribing records is so much more detailed, I've got two plots here from the work we did at Great Ormond Street. On the right hand side we've got for meropenem, which is one of the drugs that we're most um, actively trying to safeguard against the use of because it's um, one of our last line antibiotics. We've got every single day of um, meropenem use over nine years and you can see we've fitted a, um, a curve called an autoregressive moving average curve um, to the data which accounts for some seasonality and also autocorrelation within our data. And this allowed us to get some really nice um, quite narrow estimates of, of how our antibiotic use was changing over time. So, um, for the first six, seven years, we had a, a yearly increase of about 1% of this drug. And then in 2016, we implemented a, a range of me measures to try and reduce the overuse of meropenem. And actually, we could show that we, we were able to effectively reduce the antibiotic use. In comparison, on the left-hand side, we simulated what would happen if we'd taken the same data but done a yearly point prevalence survey where we took a snapshot of data over time. And then this is nine simulations, and we've plotted a linear curve to see exactly what the change in over time is. And as you can see, it's, it's just vastly different in terms of the granularity that you get and the, the ability to, to make sense of the data. So what we did in Oxford is we, we implemented a quality improvement project using what's called a PDSA cycle, which um, people who work in the NHS will probably have heard of. It's quite a common methodology used to, to try and um, improve a process. Um, and essentially, you go around this cycle of planning what you're doing, acting it out, um, studying what you've done, and then repeating that over and over again. So the planning stage essentially involved talking to all of the stakeholders, so particularly the paediatric infectious disease doctors and the pharmacists who are responsible for safeguarding these drugs. Also talking to the informatics team and the information governance teams about how we're going to get the data, where it's going to be stored and all of those things. And then building on my previous experience, um, I identified sort of the packages and the processes that we might need to try and develop a dashboard to try and display all of the data that we wanted to see. So we did a static export of the data to sort of try and develop the dashboards. Um, I then established a, a cleaning pipeline to try and make sure that the data was accurate and, and had no bugs. Um, and then I built a prototype dashboard using R and R Shiny and a few other packages. Um, and then we tried to see how that would work. Um, so this is an example screenshot from, from the dashboards, um, which allows us to see um, drugs over time. I think we've got um, so this is meropenem versus piperacillin over time um, in a couple of our wards um, and it essentially shows how the two relate to each other. Um, and what you can see here is that actually there's lots, lots of things that you can change here so that the end users can really change what they're, what they're seeing. And that's really useful to them because actually they're the ones that have all the questions that need answering. The infectious disease doctors and, and the pharmacists, they need to see a whole host of different things and it's not up to um, us to really tell them what they want to see. We just need to give them as much of the data as, as we can. Um, there are lots of different functions in terms of how you look at the data and what data you input. Um, and also the graphics that were downloadable so that they could take them away and, and um, put them in reports and things like that. And this is just another example and, and you can see here that you can change how you're seeing the data in terms of the plot types and things like that. Um, this one. So then we went to the study phase, which is essentially just looking at what we had and, and reviewing it with the, the end users and saying, actually, um, is this fit for purpose? We also looked at the data against what we expected to see and making sure that there weren't any issues with sort of um, reports that didn't make any sense. Fortunately, um, generally was quite good. Um, we found a couple of bugs that we managed to fix in terms of how the data was being coded. Um, and then the infectious disease doctors um, reviewed this and, and said, actually, yeah, this is what we want, but there are a few additional things, features and functionalities that we want to add. 
Um, so we identified these and then we worked in terms of implementing them um, and so we added a few functionalities and, and we've now got this working um, live and we have monthly data updates um, and we can and we regularly try and review the performance of what's happening. Um, and so one of the updates that they wanted, I've just added here, is um, they really felt that although the graphs were really useful, it would actually be helpful to have the tables as well, because then they could go away with the raw numbers, and if they wanted to do anything else with that, then they could. Um, so really trying to make the data as accessible to them as possible. And so what's the impact been? Well, it's been live since 2021, so the end of 2021 to November, about a year now. Um, we've managed to show that we've reduced overall antibiotic use. Um, after we've implemented a number of stewardship initiatives, as you can see in the green plot on the top. Um, and also looking at meropenem, as I mentioned, a drug that we want to try and really safeguard against overuse of. Um, a few months ago, we were able to spot an abnormal trend in terms of a, an increase in meropenem use. And that actually, able, because it's, we can look at ward level prescribing, we could actually see exactly where that was happening. And the pharmacist could go and look why there was an excess of this drug being given out. And we were able to, to combat that. This has also actually allowed us to um, undertake a pilot project with another hospital. And this is really about benchmarking use against other centers. So not just looking at your own antibiotic use, but against what everyone else is doing. And that's the only way that we can really share best practice. So um, this is actually pre-publication from something we're trying to publish. So I've taken all the labels off, but essentially each color here is a different antibiotic. And the top plot is one hospital and the bottom plot is, is the other. And these plots give us a really good way of saying, actually, what are we doing well? How do we compare against each other? And how can we learn from each other's practice? So the project was, has definitely not been without challenges, and these are ongoing. Information governance within the NHS is always really tricky. It took us a while to get over sort of actually getting access to the data and um, persuading them that we were going to keep it safe. Probably the biggest hurdle in terms of uh, relevance to today is um, the internal IT infrastructure really wasn't set up to deal with um, using R. And that there was a real lack of familiarity and still is within the IT team at the trust with using R. Um, and I think a lack of trust because it's not something that most of them have used before. It's not a commercially available product. So um, there is a lack of trust, unfortunately, from some of the IT teams that we found. Um, and it means it's been really difficult to assimilate it with the existing architectures of the IT systems. And what we've actually ended up having to do is have a local version running on, our, um, on one of our pharmacist laptops, which is not ideal, but it, it works. Um, in terms of maintenance, that's, that takes up quite a lot of time. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a data scientist, as I said, I don't have all the solutions in terms of how do we automate the data downloads and things like that. Um, and a lot of that's having to be done manually. Um, and the maintenance, again, debugging, um, I'm currently doing all of that. And part of the issue here is this is a completely unfunded project. And this is done in my spare time, um, largely. Um, and it would be lovely to have this as something that's more formalized and set up to, to help the trust. So current issues that still exist, so all of the data exports happen via SQL um, and completely separate process and then the data is given to us um, and then we run it through our quality control pipeline and then um, it gets uploaded to our Shiny and we can see it and um, the trends over time. Um, the implementation is only in a very local instance on one computer, which is a real shame and I'd love to have it much more widely available. I did float the idea of having it available on our trust intranet, but that's unfortunately so far not been possible. Um, and in terms of the context of everyone else's talks, we don't have a GitHub repo for this yet, which is something I'm, I'm working on. Um, and I haven't yet posted this on the NHR to our community, which I'm very, very new to. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, and hear any suggestions that anyone has for how we can solve some of these issues. And I'm definitely going to be posting on the NHSR website to try and see, actually, does anyone have any ideas about how we can improve this project? Because it's very much a work in progress. So a few future aims just very quickly. We want to add a few more functions. Um, and we want to try and use this to evaluate actually what we're doing already and, and how, are we, um, how are our existing initiatives working. Um, we want to try and expand this to other sites. So there is some work to try and share a lot of this work to, with different sites. Um, and we also would like to add in the resistance data so we can see actually how does our prescribing relate to what bugs are becoming resistance. Um, and I would love to develop it into an R package, but at the moment I just don't have the time to do that. But it's something that I really would like to do in the future so that I can share it more widely. Very quickly, take home messages. So we have lots of data, but we're not using it in most instances. And actually just increasing how much we can see the data um, and the interpretability of that data in, in easy to read graphics is really powerful. And the clinicians have said it is really, really, really helpful to what they're doing. And you don't need complex methods or statistics necessarily to be impactful here. Um, there are some really difficult challenges that we still haven't overcome, um, but hopefully we can do that in the next few years. 
Um, lots of acknowledgements, which I won't go through, but it's like most things, it's very collaborative, so I just wanted to have this slide here. Um, and if anyone wants to contact me, here's my details and my, my Twitter handle. If you go on my Twitter handle, you see I very rarely post, but I'm um, very happy to be contacted. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I think we, uh, we've actually had our first speaker of the Lightning Talks um, unable to attend today, so I'm happy to give a minute or two to questions if anyone would like to raise any questions. That, that seems like no, no burning questions, but, so thank you again, that's brilliant. Uh, so we'll move into uh, a set of Lightning Talks now, so just as a reminder, Lightning Talks are, like the name suggests, very quick. So there will be quick changeover between the speakers. Um, for the speaker's benefit, I'll give you a, a wave or a shout, depending on whether you're looking at me, one minute before the end of your allotted slot. Um, and if you're a speaker and you haven't yet spoken to our AV crew to get your microphone and such sorted, could you please do that? Thank you, right, I'll hand over to our first speaker, Suzanne. Hi, um, my name's uh, Dan Wyand. I'm a, a medical microbiologist um, working in Newcastle. So I'm a, I'm a doctor who works in a laboratory and um, I started uh, using R about uh, a year and a half ago and it's really blown my mind what's uh, possible to achieve with it. Um, one of the things that I've been doing with it is uh, writing entirely referenced um, papers for publication using just R. Um, and using um, either RMD or Quarto and the Cytel package. Um, so um, they say that um, the hardest part to any project is starting. Uh, once you get that out of the way, uh, then you should find that the rest of the journey is much easier. However, uh, they also say that many will start fast and few will finish strong. Um, and in my opinion, uh, the thing that usually happens with projects in the NHS is that people start them, but they never finish them. Uh, so I think that um, R can be incredibly useful at making one of the hardest parts of any project much easier. Um, uh, R Markdown and Quarto um, can help with uh, referencing, so uh, adding citations to papers. It can help with cross-referencing. It can add bibliographies. Um, you can publish in various formats, depending on uh, what the journal wants from you, um, PDF, HTML, Word document, and so on. You can add code chunks, and um, uh, that may include um, uh, tables, diagrams, figures. And um, as a result of using R and uh, Quarto, um, then the entire um, document that, is, that you produce at the end is entirely reproducible from start to finish. Um, so um, if the editor asks you to change a little bit, about your um, manuscript. Uh, in the old days, you would have had to go back to Excel, copy and paste into a Word document, uh, maybe change some references, uh, and the whole thing would take um, you know, a long time, several hours, maybe days. Uh, and in my experience with um, our Markdown and Quarto, all of a sudden it takes um, minutes, if not hours. Um, so in order to um, use our Markdown or Quarto for this purpose, um, then, um, in my case, I've installed Zotero to uh, create a bib file uh, for the academic references. Um, then you can go to the Zotero style repository to download a CSL file that lets you uh, edit your references in a particular format. Um, then you um, create a docx format uh, document um, to, for example, um, use the, uh, the fonts and so on that the journal wants you to use. A CSS file can be used to add, for example, double spacing. And finally, you just have to set the, the YAML or knitter options um, to um, make your document look the way that, it, that you want it to. Um, and finally, I'll go into how CITA fits into the whole thing as well. Uh, CITA is not available on CRAN, uh, so it's a case of installing it directly from GitHub. Um, so in the YAML, uh, you just signpost to the various uh, documents that I've just referred to. So the docx doc document, the bib file, the CSS file, uh, the CSL file. And then if you say link citations true, then that leads to people when they open the document being able to click on the, um, on the reference and it goes straight to the bibliography, which I think is pretty clever. In Quarto, um, there's a option of adding cite proc and uh, selecting true. And then that leads to 
um, the references being added um, automatically as well. So Quarter is slightly more advanced than R Markdown in that way. Um, so we load our packages and um, uh, select appropriate Netter options, um, and then we add citations. In the old days, uh, if we wanted to add, for example, this paper to our, um, to our list of references, then in the worst case scenario, someone does that manually with pen and paper. Um, in uh, conventional R Markdown, you could um, use the, um, the key um, in your bib file to highlight um, the paper that you want to, uh, to add. So here you are adding that Anhoy paper from a moment ago. Um, but with CITER, what, what you get is uh, an add-on button um, on your uh, menu uh, in, in our studio. You click on add-ins, you click on insert citations, and then you just have a fuzzy search that you can um, use to find the paper of interest rather than having to remember what the key is for your paper. So um, I've been finding this incredibly useful to, uh, to add bibliographies to, to my papers. Um, Quarto also lets you um, use clever cross-referencing cross functionality. For example, um, if we want to add um, uh, a ggplot, um, we can um, give it this name, so fig air quality, and then in the text you can say, um, you can reference that document by using the at key um, to then um, lead to the final product looking like this. So it gives you uh, the figure in the, in the text and it gives you um, a caption underneath and the figures in there as well. So imagine that the editor wants you to mildly change that plot. All of a sudden, you can quickly do that in, in, um, in the R Markdown. Um, to add references to a document, you just add this um, refs div to the, uh, to the document, and um, that's your references added. Uh, so it's just incredible what you can achieve. And um, I just wanted to quickly show you what it looks like in real life. So um, as part of um, my job, I was looking at um, the use of antimicrobials uh, that um, uh, healthcare workers uh, say that patients get treated with, and um, you get all sorts of gobbledygook written on them. And uh, I thought this would make an interesting paper for the Christmas BMJ. So I wrote the Christmas BMJ part article, which has been accepted uh, in Quarto, uh, or R Markdown in this case. Um, and as you can see, uh, you've got the, the docx file referred to here, the bib file, the CSS file, the CSL file, and link citation is true. You can load your packages that you use for the, for the project. Um, you can put in your, your text using um, standard markdown language. Um, you can add citations, um, as you can see I've done that already here because of time. Um, and at the end I've added this references div and um, the end product, you just click knit and you let um, R Mark do, do, do its thing. And um, uh, it quickly produces um, a document from scratch that you can then send to the editor for publication. Um, so uh, in the space of a few seconds, it's done what would have taken a human many hours. Um, so the final product um, uh, is in the format that the, the, the journal wants. Uh, it's got all the text in the right place, it's got references using the appropriate uh, referencing style for the journal, um, and everything's um, included uh, at the end as a, as a bibliography. Um, and yeah, in the process, code chunks have been used to add tables um, and figures, and um, yeah, as I say, the, the whole thing um, is just extremely smooth. Um, so I hope that more people use R Markdown and Quarto to uh, try and publish their papers um, in journals, and um, thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. As someone who's wasted lots of time trying to cite things, I could see how uh, incredibly useful and quick that must be. So thank you for that. Um, I'll pass over to our next speaker, to Louise. Hello everyone, I'm Louise and I work as a Cancer Intelligence Analyst for the National Disease Registration Service, which at the minute is a part of NHS Digital. And I work as one of my, the things I do at work is I work with the radiotherapy data set. So the radiotherapy data set collects uh, standardised data. Every month we get data coming in from 51 radiotherapy providers in England and we also get information from 
uh, Welsh providers about patients who live in England. And this data is used for a variety of different reasons, such as service planning, commissioning, clinical practice and research. So when we get this data, that it's used for a number of different things. We run a number of internal and also external reports that are sent to stakeholders. And we've just listed a number of the, some of the different reports that we run. So we run quite a lot of reports and these uh, are run on different dates. So either monthly, quarterly or annually. So when I first joined the radiotherapy data set team a couple of years ago, this was the legacy reporting process. We would run a query in the SQL database. We would export the output to a CSV file. We would then do data carpentry using pivot tables in Excel and also make some additional calculations such as totals, percentages, proportions. Once this was done, we would copy and paste that data into a final report template. Once that was done, that was done to produce a report and then most of the process would be repeated again for the QA steps because we always ensure that we're sending out really good quality, correct data. So again, another analyst would then run the, run the query in the SQL database, export to a CSV file, do some pivot tables and additional calculations and then compare that to what the uh, first analyst did. Okay, so as you can imagine, this is quite a time consuming process. It's not very straightforward. Uh, we used to, we, used to, we uh, measured how long it took us to produce, how much time we spent working on the reports and the QA process. Uh, just for example here, we've got one of the reports that we run on a monthly basis would take about six hours to produce. Uh, one of the quarterly reports took in total of 43 hours to produce that report. So a lot of time is being spent on this. Also, it's a lot of human interaction to produce a report, which means there's a lot of potential for human error. So in that monthly report I mentioned that took about six hours to produce, there was five tabs of data, and within that there were 90 individual pieces of data that required to be copied and pasted into this internal report. Uh, some of our reports contain a lot of data, for example, a quarterly report, 32 tabs of data. So this is a lot of data we're working with, lots of potential for error, even though we're, we're doing QA. Um, it's, if anyone else wants to rerun the data at a later date, it's difficult, you can't reproduce the data easily the way it was originally produced. Also, it's quite boring, so we don't want to be doing boring work, we want to be doing uh, really interesting work that adds lots of value. Okay. So what we did was, this is, now this was a bottom-up approach, so essentially after running once and copying and pasting 90 times, I thought there's a better way to do this, I know we can do this with R. So that's what we did. So we started off just doing it on one report and then we like, as we did reports, we started to do them in, using R. So essentially we used, we used R Markdown documents and this was good because you could do things in chunks and you could copy chunks and people would work on them together. Um, we, pulled this, we, pulled, we pulled the data from our database using this, the original SQL query, so we didn't change any of that, using the DBI package, pulled that into our Markdown document. Then we used the Tidyverse and also I used the data.table packages in order to perform data carpentry to get that data into the final format required for the final report. Then we use the OpenXLSX package. And what this does is we can use it in order to ensure that the output, rather than just writing to a CSV file, we're creating a fully formatted Excel report. And that's and we wanted to, we didn't change that and we wanted to keep it as Excel reports because that's what gets sent out to trust and people can then um, open the Excel document easily and look at, interrogate that data. And we document all of our data processes in process documents and we use, we commit everything to uh, Tortoise SVN, which is a repository that we use. Okay, so this is an example script. Um, you just have to input, you have to say which reports you want to make, the dates that you're, the report is reporting on. Uh, this, this is an example of one where we can produce three different reports, annual, quarterly, 
monthly, just fill in this data, press run, go have a cup of tea, come back, your report comes out. So it comes out fully formatted, thanks to the XLSX package, exactly how it gets sent out to our trusts. So some comments on this. So initially, we spent more time writing the R scripts and uh, coming up with the methodology in order to do this that it may have taken to just make an individual report using the legacy methodology. But in the long run, this has really paved off and we saved a lot of time. That report I mentioned that used to take over 40 hours to produce, it's now produced in 20 minutes. Um, so we did this, like I said, we did this from the bottom up as we did a report. So we QA'd the process by running the methods in parallel. And over time, everything became integrated into R. So this is a really good opportunity for, to upskill and learn new, uh, learn new methods in R and to apply those. And we did, it, we did it also partly as a team, and that gave everyone the chance to upskill their skills. Um, and we were able to then apply this across multiple reports. So what we're working on now is uh, automating more of the QA process. And we're going to be making this also very shortly available on the NHS Digital GitHub page. Okay, so just thank you to Kirsten and Michael and Michelle, Alex and Catherine who've been involved in creating and curating these reports. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. That's exactly the sort of thing that we hope the R community can help with as well as the, the moving those processes into reproducible fashion. So thank you very much. Uh, now introduce our next speaker, Annie. Thank you. Um, sorry, let me just start a timer so I can keep the time. Cool. So hello, everyone. I'm Annie. I work for Harborshire County Council. Um, I'll be talking about using the box package to reuse functions across projects. So just to briefly summarize what the box package does, if you're not aware of it already, box is an R package that allows you to write, save, and use modular code without requiring the user to create entire packages. Um, you can obviously find more information in their GitHub page. Um, and this might be quite a controversial opinion to not make packages and just to do something else. Um, so just stick with me and you'll see what I mean. There might be use cases for both packages and uh, box modules. So jumping straight into the example, let's say in this scenario, which is quite common in my opinion, a colleague in your team has developed a useful function that will be useful for the rest of the team. Uh, you'll know it'll be useful across projects as well. So what do you do next? One way is everyone starts copying and pasting the same code to every project. People do this across the team. So there's a lot of duplication of code. Um, obviously, as our users, we uh, try to follow good practice and try to not do this. Uh, so the better way to address this is to use box modules. The other way is, of course, packaging your code. But in some cases, when it's just one single function like that, you might not want to make an entire package or you might have different reasons for not wanting to make a package. So box modules is kind of uh, a nice alternative. So what you can do, I'm just gonna briefly showcase how our team um, uses Box. So we just copy and paste the code into a new script. We called it fingertips in this example because this function deals with processing fingertips data. So that's an online resource if you don't know. Um, so just simple copy and pasting into this. And obviously you can put other functions in here as well. If you have other um, functions related to the processing of fingertips data, you can do that. But in this example, it's just a singular function. And then just make sure that you namespace everything. So for example, um, I don't know if you can see, but there's a red box here. So just highlighting the fact that I've namespaced everything. And if you can't namespace certain things like the magnitude pipe, then you use the box use uh, function there to kind of call the specific pipe from the magnitude package, which is also good practice to namespace in your functions. Um, and then the last thing that you need to do is to use some R oxygen tags. So if you've made R packages before, you're probably very familiar with R oxygen tags. If you're not familiar with them, I think the most important ones to remember are the add param and the add export tags. So the add export is important because if you don't add the add export tag, your um, code isn't going to be exported in the module. 
So you need that, otherwise it will remain kind of as an internal function. Um, and the param is just good because you can list all of your, um, I don't know if it's very clear, sorry about the, the colors, but um, you can list each of the arguments and then provide a short description that is not very visible, but they're there. Uh, short description for each, each argument, which is good for documentation purposes. And that's basically it. Your modular code is now reusable. So all that's left to do is to use it. Um, you can save that script that we um, just did somewhere in a place that you know. And then you just call that script using this line of code right here. So this is kind of equivalent to the uh, library calls. So this is kind of saying library fingertips. Uh, fingertips being the script that we just saved and it's saved. I saved it into a folder called PHI functions and then the dot dot slash is just because I'm in a folder that's two stages uh, above it. So just make sure the path is correct. And then once that is referenced, it will be in your environment and then you can call, you can call the function using the dollar sign operator there. So from the fingertips environment, you're calling the differences function. And then you just use it as you would and I mentioned help pages. So box modules also have documentation, uh, which is very good because even if you're not making a package, you can still have this nice looking help page documentation to help your colleagues understand what your function does. So this is very much dependent on the argsgen tags that, um, so you have to write all this to make it neat. The, the function is not going to do it for you, but it's just good practice to have good documentation. Right, and this is just a screenshot of um, what our team has done over time. We've used the box package for um, almost a year now, I think. So we've obviously added a lot of functions into several different scripts, as you can see in that screenshot over there. Um, so we just put them by topic and then everybody has access to these functions because we've saved that as an R project and put it into a GitHub repo, um, GitLab in this case. And we just ask everyone uh, in our team to kind of git clone that repo and then everybody has access to the code. So provided that everybody has their um, uh, folder structure organized the same way, so we make sure that we standardize that so that these kinds of paths don't break. We kind of have the same folder structure. Provided that that is consistent, Everybody can, you know, use the functions that people have created, uh, reuse it across projects, reuse it across a team. So why use box instead of packaging your functions? Well, there might be some cases when you don't want to make a package. So if you have, you know, odds and ends like functions that don't seem significant enough to package, you might want to put it in a box module. Um, if you don't want to publish a package to GitHub due to there being sensitive information in the function, or if you have difficulties due to IT uh, publishing on GitHub, um, or even downloading and installing packages from GitHub, you might want to try using box modules as an alternative. Or if you just haven't learned package development yet and you don't have time to learn it just yet, or you don't have time to write all the unit testing that is involved in um, the packaging process, then you can just quickly do it um, using the box module method. And then as you can see, sorry, I'm switching slides very quickly. You can see that a lot of these things that you do in a box module is very similar to the process of writing a, an R package, like the R oxygen tags, they're all there in the R package uh, process as well. And then all the namespacing. So you can tell that it's very easy to kind of transition from a box module code to an R package. So it's not really time lost if you decide to do the box module first, and then over time you decide, I want to put it in a package. Well, it's not time lost because the code is quite similar. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to quickly gloss over some of the cons of this. So I think the big one is that it can't really be used easily in deployed shiny apps. So, sorry, I'm just gonna skip slides again. So what that means is, um, again, it's very much dependent on this line of code working. 
So once you deploy uh, the code for a Shiny app, and if it relies on that, it's obviously not gonna find it because it's not gonna exist in that kind of environment. So uh, what our team kind of does is we try to do all the pre-processing of our data for Shiny apps in a different project. We pre-process everything, um, which obviously works with the box module method, and then everything on our Shiny apps just relies on kind of pinned data or exported data from that process. But if you do rely on you know, processing your data within Shiny apps, then you might have to package your functions. And there's some other ones like you need to make sure the paths are correct and you need to manually update the module. So if a colleague were to add a new code, then you kind of have to manually like get pull those changes. And that's it, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Annie. That's an approach I've not seen before. So that's really interesting. Thanks for bringing that. Can I hand over to our next speaker, please? Richie? Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ruchi, and I'm currently a doctor training in radiology, currently based in Oxford. I'm going to share with you work that was done back when I was a newly qualified doctor in Leicester, and it involved creating a script in order to automatically extract data from PDFs to support clinical research, which happened to be in childhood asthma. Okay, so to start with, I'm no expert in programming at all, just very much an enthusiast and a fish out of water today. And it's the first time I've been at such a conference where clinicians and more technically minded people are meeting. So I was not really sure how, how to present this work or what you're expecting and whether you're expecting lines of written code. I personally am a bit slow to read code. So instead I've just talked about my process and documented sort of a journey through this project. So, one of my initial jobs in Leicester was with the paediatric department, and I really got along with the team um, there during this rotation. And one of the misconceptions that the paediatric respiratory doctors were talking about was asthma in children and how the medical profession had misunderstandings about this. And this echoed my own misunderstandings of childhood asthma. In particular, it is poorly understood and in fact, we don't really have any good data to suggest what happens to lung function in children with asthma over time. A particular type of lung function test is called spirometry. And what this involves is that the patient flows into a tube and this gives us data regarding how healthy, how elastic their lungs are and how much volume of air they can breathe in and out. Spirometry data in Leicester was outputted to a PDF file for clinicians to read and use in their clinics. The team have a large cohort of asthma patients and years of spirometry data. There could be some key insights within this, but for it to be analysed, it needs to be in some sort of data frame, whether that's a CSV file or an Excel file. Um, it was just not, it was not easy to analyse within PDFs. And their current approach and solution was to just manually copy and paste uh, documents, sorry, co manually copy and paste the different values from these PDFs into an Excel table. This was where I took an interest as I felt there had to be a way to automatically extract this data that could save time. So I'll start with the failed attempts. Um, to avoid unnecessary sort of work, I approached the, the company that provided the spirometry equipment and software. And it was believed there was a database somewhere within the software with, with all the, the test data um, there. And that's also what the company rep believed However, that was not the case. And um, when it came to like pulling out that data, it was just not working for whatever reasons. So I moved on to writing a script within R. And after a bit of Googling, I came across different PDF reader packages, including one called PDF tools. And this is just a package that helped read PDF files effectively. Um, unfortunately, that also did not work and um, it wouldn't consistently pick out the right value. It was about 10% of the time getting the right values that I wanted. And to explain why they weren't working, um, this is an example of a PDF file. It has um, some, patient, so some patient demographic data, a table, some graphs, and some more free text at the bottom. And, that lo and it looks very similar. Two different PDF files may look very similar, but the way I thought of it and the way I realized to understand PDF files 
for whatever reasons, the, the underlying scaffolding or structure to different PDF documents would be different. And these PDF reader packages would, would rely on this underlying scaffolding. And so it meant when I tried to say, pick a value out of, let's say, gender, it would look in a different box each time between different PDF documents. And hence, that's at least how I understood why my current solution was not working. My third attempt, however, was successful. And just as I was about to give up, I, I sort of started Googling about OCR, or optical character recognition. And in my mind, I thought I would have to write all the code to somehow like read um, text, as it were. Um, but I was very pleased to find something called Tesseract. And it, this is already, it, it does that for you effectively, it runs OCR for you. It's an open source package that allows users to run OCR on files. And best of all, all the data stays locally within, within the computer. Um, it's very easy to run, and I was able to understand it. And, and actually, the biggest process throughout the whole process was just downloading R and R Studio onto an NHS computer. Um, that was more challenging than me trying to figure out how to run this. So um, I'm just going to sort of explain how the code, uh, the logic behind the code. So there were three things I had to set up initially. Um, firstly, I had to set up the Tesseract engine. Um, that was two lines of code, and it effectively was just to say, I want to read English text instead of another language. The next thing I had to set up was I had to look up all the PDF files within the subfolder. And so there were lots of different files um, within these folders, including Excel files, Word documents. And again, it was just a case of listing all the files in the directory and just filtering out for PDF files. And lastly, I just had to create a data frame for me to put my data into. So with all the PDF files, I would then loop over each PDF file and run OCR on optical character recognition on each of these PDFs. And this would generate a vector of text. And so there'll be like 100, 200 different elements within this vector, and each element would be a different word, for example, or value. And then this is the bit where I had to start identifying patterns within, within this vector. So for example, if I wanted to extract the patient height at the time of each lung function test, what I noticed was that the word, if I looked up the word height as an element, and let's say that was the 30th element within my vector, I can pretty much guarantee the next element would be the value for height. So the 31st element would be the value for height. And I would look for these patterns of logic, as it were, and I could extract different um, bits of data that I needed or the team needed to analyze one function. Um, so yeah, that, that, so once I've identified the right bit of data, I then put this into a data frame and that was ready for analysis, whether that was done in Excel or uh, uh, by other means, um, that, that, was, that, was, that was, was done. Um, so the results, it was ran on just a, a cohort of kids with very difficult to control asthma. And there's approximately um, 1,000, well, there was 1,724 PDFs within this cohort. Manual extraction, assuming that, um, assuming that you can just sort of, um, the person copying and pasting it wouldn't get tired. It took about 100 seconds per PDF to get all the right bits of information and data from the PDF and just copy and paste it into an Excel table. The script on a slow NHS laptop took about 20 seconds per PDF. And it took me about eight hours to write it to a level where it was consistent. So approximately, just, just for example's sake, it took about it saved about 30 hours of work on this cohort. Um, my conclusion and summary from all this is that I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit uh, within healthcare where just sort of simple scripts can really help speed things up, make things efficient, and actually do things that would otherwise take a lot of time. And a lot of data is, I guess, PDF-based or document-based. And I think something like OCR or Tesseract would be quite good for that. Um, make friends with IT, so that was a huge stumbling block. And um, just having someone that we, we knew in IT who was just very happy, his name was Jignesh Tandel, so thank you very much um, to, in terms of supporting us downloading r and Studio. I think I went through the official channels first, and after two months, I got given a no. So I'm just very grateful just having someone friendly around to support us with that. Um, and in the future, we'll run this, we can run the script on the whole cohort of, um, of patients, not just asthma patients, but patients with other lung diseases as well. Um, 
And I'll finally like to thank Dr. Steve Harris, who introduced me to R back when I was a medical student at uni. Um, he's a clinician uh, based in London, and his team were um, doing quite incredible, inspiring things with R, and he sort of took me along and let me sort of learn from the team. So thank you. Thank you for listening. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much. What a, what a time saving. That's does it, it does seem like there must be lots of other areas that we could use that and apply that across uh, across all sorts of areas. Yeah, I think, so. I think so. so. Thank you very much. Um, can I invite our next speaker up, Sebastian? Hi. Um, so this afternoon I'm going to be talking about some of the work I've been doing uh, over with the renal department at Manchester Royal Infirmary and the Northwest Regional MDT into vascular disease and glomerulonephritis. nephritis. So this is um, a case study which was based on a prediction model for uh, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. So it's a very, very nasty condition where people rock up to A&E uh, coughing up blood or with blood in their urine and is then diagnosed through a blood test and subsequent kidney biopsy. It doesn't uh, affect the entire vascular system, but specifically renal involvement is very common and that's been our focus. Uh, we've got 23 million cases per year in this country and unfortunately a lot of patients do end up on, uh, in ESKD, so that is on dialysis or renal transplant permanently. So the, my colleague uh, and PI Silka uh, developed a risk score uh, for uh, people with um, AAV uh, while she was working in Germany and based on a cohort of about 200 people with the data um, collected prospectively. It was made up of three components, the GFR, um, the percentage of normal glomerulus and very small cells within your kidneys that do get damaged by the autoimmune condition and then the uh, level of uh, damage in the uh, interstitium. So you've got the risk points assigned, and here we have a lovely picture of a, a crescentic sclerosed glomerulus. Um, it's all done, this is all done through histology and pathology, which has led to a lot of problems in the sort of measurement, both in the kidney biopsy, which can be unreliable because of the randomness of have you just got a patch of particularly badly sclerosed glomeruli, and then the poor measurement and inter-observer uh, ag agreement of, of the measurement of IFTA. So within the, our project Anchor Refine, we were going to go out and validate the original score that was developed about five years ago in a much larger international cohort with much longer follow-up. Uh, we we're going to potentially refine it and develop a new model and fundamentally as a statistician coming into it, we're going to do it properly. So the design of our, our, our study uh, does very much rely on our international partners and national partners from uh, the NHS. We had 20 years of follow-up data compared to three in the original study, well up to 20 years of follow-up, and that led us to the largest ever cohort of anchor patients at 1439, which we decided to go for a uh, split to make a, a development cohort of nine, uh, 959. So to come back to the problems in prediction, is there are absolutely no shortage of prediction models. Many of you will have been uh, using um, prediction in your, in your day jobs, but specifically within prediction models, there were really no shortages. And there's a lot of flaws. So here are just a selection of systematic reviews people have done, which all pretty much come to the same um, conclusion that poor quality uh, methods and reporting has led to a lack of replicability and high risk of bias. So uh, here is the lovely leaky pipeline of prognostic modelling from Van Royen's paper this year. So we are going to be so today I'm going to really be talking about the validation of, of these models. So specifically that we now actually have an incentive to validate. We have the data and our incentive is there are competing scores out there that we wanted to uh, bash a bit. So our model was a survival model as, as talked about um, earlier by the uh, Northwest London study, which involves right censoring. So we really didn't want to throw away data because people not getting up to the time point, but also knowing when the event happened, especially on longer follow-up. So 
You also have a lot of these methods use uh, Cox proportional hazards, which is a semi-parametric and extremely flexible uh, modeling technique, but it does then have its drawbacks, and we have really had to deal with multiple time points. So my methodology uh, for the study came, was mainly derived from uh, the Royston and Altman paper in 2013, which I've read many times. So firstly, I fitted a new model. This is the, one of the two main models we use, the continuous model made up of uh, creatinine rather than GFR for various measurement reasons, uh, because it was more reliable and over a much larger distribution of values. And then again, our normal and IFTA values. And now, frequently, that what is not reported within survival models compared to binary models is the uh, baseline survival function. So here we have a hypothetical, we fit our model, and then a hypothetical patient with a creatinine of one, no normal glons, and low IFTA, which would never really exist in real life because we have a normal creatinine of about 100 or so, and should also have 100% uh, normal glons as healthy adults. Uh, but this it is much easier to deal with a patient that has a relative risk of zero or the, the index, of which then we can ex extract our uh, time points, our survival, and then flip a flexible polynomial curve. Um, the indices of the time values was literally me playing around until the residuals fitted nicely and the assumptions of, lid, of linear regression weren't violated as badly which then comes on to generating our predictions based from our validation data set, which was again a, ran the, a random one third of the overall data that was collected. Um, so this was an internal rather than an external validation. So various things with the generating linear predictions and then calculating the deciles of the, pop of the population, uh, one, to, one through 10, use, I personally use the midpoint, and then also grouping these DSARs for, for, to use the Kaplan-Meier estimates, which are slightly different and would allow us to see whether we have the proportional has on the whole, whether the proportional hazards assumption of, of our Cox modeling sort of worked pretty well. So there was a load of GG plot code below this that you can all go and see on the GitHub. And I'm happy to take anyone through, through the code, uh, just send me some abuse on Twitter. And this is our overall results. So our original score continued to perform, perform well, and the new models uh, had improved performance. There is a lovely GG plot that I spent way too long on, uh, which is the complementary model which assigns risk points because for some reason doctors really love giving uh, scores. So, and there is some values and you can work through them. I was worried personally about propagation of uh, rounding, but seemed to be fine overall. So there is our lovely calibration plot. You can see that our overall, our predictions matched uh, in the validation cohort, matched what we found in the development cohort, uh, which shows strong use of the model and can be far, w further implemented in clinical practice. So the real challenge is, just to, to round off, is that unfortunately at the moment, STATA is better than R for survival, and that a lot of the reprex and the methodological help comes in the form of STATA, which I really don't like, and that the survival library is not really, bought, uh, really built for this. And I have had a lot of arguments with uh, medical staff about what the priorities were. So the takeaway is please calibrate your models, please follow the guidance from uh, Gary Collins and KM Moons, uh, in publishing your models, even in non-academic circles. And uh, there is going to be a shiny app, hopefully, if the MHRA don't have a, uh, an argument with me. So thank you very much to all of our centres, uh, all of our team colleagues, and you can see all the references for the talk on GitHub. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's really interesting to see the visualization as well at the end. I've, I've found survival models really hard to get a nice visualization. So that, that was really good. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll invite to another speaker up then. Can I invite Batu? Hi everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm very conscious of time. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking about smart analysis. I'm just gonna describe a small story of us and how we developed an R data set 
uh, our data set package for um, encephalitis. Uh, as I mentioned, oh, as previous uh, actually speakers mentioned, we have a lot of data, but it's hardly been used. And before I say anything, I'm, I'm not an English native speaker, so if you don't understand my pronunciation, please let me know, I can repeat what I'm saying. Um, again, it's not related to the NHS. Uh, it's a work in progress. It's something that we started working on in Kmart in Saudi Arabia uh, and just came here to share it and get some feedback. Uh, before I start, just want to say thank you so much. Uh, this would be impossible without the help of Dr. Mayal Ajaji, Rumayyan, uh, um, Abdullah Qahtani, Ahlam Al Humaydan, uh, and Sultan Al uh, Just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm affiliated with the University of Liverpool in the UK. Uh, I used to do my PhD, Master, Undergrad, but uh, my day job is in Kmark, which is uh, uh, King Abdullah International Medical Research Center. Uh, associated with the medical city, so most of our data comes uh, from this medical city. Uh, outside my academic work, I advocate for uh, open science, for R, um, so I'm part of the LIDs, so probably most of you are familiar with it. Uh, I'm also an editor of R Weekly, so if any of your materials and talk is open, please let us know so we can add it to the issue next week. Uh, I'll be talking today about a new project that we initiated, uh, which aimed to create really a comprehensive data set around encephalitis. Uh, for individuals who are not familiar with encephalitis, rather than uh, define it medically, I thought I can introduce a real case about encephalitis so you get a sense what encephalitis looks like in real life. Uh, so the case is about Abdullah. Abdullah is 19 years old. He's a second year medical student. Um, and he started showing very, um, uh, very strange symptoms. His family reported is within a week, he started to show irritability, decline in intellectual ability, depression, uh, speech problems, uh, sleep disturbance. And I think the most concern about uh, was the suicidal thoughts. Um, Probably at the very first glance, you might have blamed medical school for all of that. Uh, anyway, his family acted very, very quickly. Uh, they admitted him to the hospital. Uh, the neurologist did some routine tests. So they started with the MRI, EEG, but nothing came in in the MRI and EEG. Uh, there's no infections, there's no abnormality. Uh, they did also blood tests, the routine one. It did not show anything. So regardless of that, the neurologist is trying to treat him empirically. So empirical treatment means uh, even if you don't show any, um, anything within the results of the MRI and EEG, um, you can be treated empirically, like taking antibiotics, um, antivirals, in case you have some sort of infection, viral infection or bacterial infection like meningitis. However, his case actually started to get worse, not better. Um, so all the for neurologists who were treating him, they thought this is, has something to do with not a um, physiological problem. It has something to do with a mental problem. They recommended him that he should go and see a mental care. Uh, and this is actually the case of many, many encephalitis patients. Uh, they don't show any changes within the MRI, the EEG, the CSF, and they end up in some sort of mental facility. And I'm going to go back to that point just later on. Okay, Abdullah here is very, very fortunate case to receive some sort of consultation from uh, another neurologist who suggested that he came across similar cases of patients with similar symptoms diagnosed with some sort of uh, encephalitis or autoimmune encephalitis, that they call it GAS 65. Uh, this means in plain English, uh, inflammation of the brain uh, triggered by immunity response, like your immunity system is attacking your body. Uh, patients with autoimmune encephalitis are treated with first-line therapy, which is either steroid, uh, plasmapheresis, IVIG. In the case of Abdullah, he started his very first cycle of IVIG, and 80% of all the symptoms are gone. Uh, after completing three cycles, uh, there's no any single symptoms. He can go back uh, and take, uh, he can go back to medical school. He doesn't need any sort of medication. Uh, and the takeaway message uh, from this story 
uh, it's very, very easy to miss cases with encephalitis by family, by neurologists, and many of them really end up in a mental facility, uh, even passing away if, uh, if the treatment is delayed. Uh, delay in, in the treatment also can cause some sort of irreversible mental damage uh, or death in some cases. Um, so in some cases, encephalitis can show something in the MRI, in the EEG, but in other cases it doesn't. And that's why more awareness, uh, quicker diagnostic method, uh, more documented cases is really, really needed. You probably came through this book, which later made into a movie. It's a book called The Brain on Fire, uh, in which the author, Susanna Cahalan, explained her own story uh, when she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and she has to stay in psychiatric hospital until being diagnosed with autoimmune encephalitis. So the question is, uh, what makes encephalitis hard to diagnose? How we can develop really more understanding of encephalitis? Uh, the problem comes that cases documented within the literature is not that many in encephalitis, especially for autoimmune encephalitis. Most of the one that we have data set for is tick-borne encephalitis, um, and there's very, very limited data, and it's followed patient for two or four years. Um, if you do know one, please let us know, because we need this sort of data. Um, and, and having said that, I uh, just want to draw your attention before I speak about R, is that Encephalitis Society report that approximately half a million individuals is affected by encephalitis each year. That means one person each minute. Uh, there's very, very low awareness of the condition. 77% of the person of the people globally don't know what encephalitis is, despite the fact that many countries has higher incidence of encephalitis than multiple sclerosis, than motor neuron disease, than bacterial meningitis. Uh, and there is no any data set with large cohort, at least 100 patients uh, that we know of, well documented with their lab results, medications, symptoms, recovery, and most importantly, the EEG and MRI data. So what we did, so what we did, we started by leveraging uh, the data in 15 hospitals from 2010. And this data is aimed to help physicians in their diagnosis, scientists to find novel insight, patients to understand the recovery story. So the plan is to leverage this clinical data we had uh, while keeping the confidentiality of the patient in a secure way. Uh, we collected all the encephalitis cases from 15 hospitals since 2010. It turned out they are uh, 15, 30 cases in the system. Uh, probably the reality, there's way, way more. Uh, still, we wanted to make sure uh, we make the best of the data. We made sure it has rich metadata, it has lots, uh, it has all the symptoms, the finding, uh, the neurological examination, treatment, the outcomes, around 50 variables. And we did not stop at that, we also collected the MRI report and the MRI images uh, as nifty no adacum. Uh, associated them within the data set. We added also the EEG. Uh, we then added all of that into an R data set package. Uh, the plan is to release this package within a couple of weeks. Uh, the delay is just because we want to make sure that the last step that the patient cannot be traced back and identified because we shared so, so many rich data inside uh, the package itself. Um, just want to draw your attention that we, we really uh, kept in mind the fair principle, which you might already be familiar with it. This is just a simple framework uh, for data management that is meant to lead a greater sustainability of data is being implemented across different countries and for different disciplines. And, and fair stand for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I'm not going to go deep into it, but you very, very encouraged to read about it in the Turing way. We also use the BIS, the Brain Imaging Data Structure. It describes a simple and easy way to adopt and organize this neural imaging uh, to make it more reusable by others. Okay, as I mentioned, um, it's used right now internally, but will be made public and open source within weeks. This is a screenshot to capture how the data look like, how we can extract MRI images for each of the patient, along with the report. Uh, we utilize these amazing, we use this amazing package, which is made by also the R communities uh, to work with the DICOM images, with the NFT images. Um, 
And we also work in supplementing this data with normal MRI just to make it easier for individual to use it in various applications, um, even for teaching. We work in some sort of shiny dashboard to make it more user friendly. I'm just going to wrap up by saying, although this is very, very persistent and it's very humble, we're trying to leverage our clinical data with the MRI images to help scientists derive insights and patterns and help physician also to understand the wider spectrum of clinical symptoms to inform a better diagnostic decision. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good luck. Could I ask you to let us know when you publish your package and we'll share it around the community. So thank you very much. So I'll hand over to our last other lightning talk speakers this afternoon, Chris Beattie. And maybe you're doing more by that look. Yeah, yep. and it's not a lightning Fantastic. talk. It's a, it's a, by that standard, it's very long. So strap yourselves in. Um, I'll try and talk while I plug in. Um, so um, I just want to do a, a wrap up. Mohammed's going to got a couple of announcements to say at the end. Um, Andy, I think, did an excellent job of depressing everyone this morning, and I think that's quite right, because um, I think we should be depressed with where we are, but now I'm going to inspire you, so I think that's a good balance, it's a good way to end. I just want to quickly say first that I finally, after four, year, four long years, have got my own NHSR mug, and I've also got a nice matching one as well from our girls, so that's awesome. Um, right, so I just want to just sum up, um, it's obviously been an amazing conference, um, it's really nice to be physical again, it was really nice to see everyone at social I was very worried because it was my idea, but I think it went really well. Um, I've had loads of lovely conversations with people. So I just want to just say something about NHSR and talk about the future. I think a lot of people, because of you know, the, fun, the way the funding's gone, people weren't sure, but I want, I'm here to tell you that NHSR is obviously going to be even more awesome, which you probably already realise by now. Um, so my journey is a bit um, like NHS, you know, I've kind of grown up with NHSR. Um, so I learned in the bad old days, as I always say, and there was no NHSR, there was very little help, and it was totally miserable, I was totally on my own. And I've had loads of, loads of conversations the last two days and in the past where people are almost crying, you know, to find people like them that they can talk to. And I had that same experience in 2018. It was quite a small conference. Um, and the thing that I think fascinated me almost straight away about NHSR, in terms of what I do with my time, is that if I train 20 people in China, there's no way I can be as productive as, as those 20 people. So that time, it's really hard to, to, to work on my own and in, in, in produce that much work. Um, so Hadley Wickham talks about code as being a force multiplier, meaning, and we've heard of this again throughout the, the conference about, if you write a piece of code, it will do the same thing over and over again. Well, I always say that about people. You know, if I teach someone how to use Shiny or if I help them to use GitHub or whatever, they will do that over and over again. And often, when I show people how to do pull requests, for example, on NHSR GitHub, then they make 10 in a month. Um, so I think that's a really good example of that. Um, yes, so we've been growing and growing. Obviously, we were online the last two years in the conference um, because of COVID. It's really nice to be back um, physical. Loads of people have talked about the Goldacre Report. If you've seen me on Twitter, you've probably seen me yelling about how much I love it. So I'm just going to skip over that. Um, Sorry, recommendation 17. This is my favorite. I haven't quite got it memorized. I probably should get a tattoo. Um, basically, it says embrace a reproduce like more pipelines. Um, the thing that I really like this is it says it must be supported by all platforms and teams, and it says to make this a core focus. Of so this is not a, a weak statement. This is a very strong statement. And we, um, I'm sure you will all agree with me when I say we have a massive skills gap um, to get to there. And you know, NHSR is, is definitely part of, of, of doing that. As much as I love the Gold Acre report, I do like to point out that we actually did a lot of this stuff before um, it was ever suggested to us. So these are some of the, the, some of the, the individual recommendations. Support an NHS analytics community. Well, obviously, we're already doing that. Develop an annual data of a conference. You're sitting in it right now, and it's completely awesome. Um, ensure all training is open to default. So NHSR has always been open right from the very word go. Open is not a new thing to us. We were doing it before it was cool. Um, and I do like to point that out. It's, a, it's a, one of our absolutely core. There are two core values for me. Open and we love beginners. And that's, that's the recipe. Um, and 19 as well, curate and maintain a curated national library of NHS aligned code. Now, we have not done that, that's a lot of work. However, my second favorite NHSR repo, my favorite obviously being plot the dots, is the demos and how to's repo. Do have a look um, at it, do make a pull request. I guarantee if you look, look through it, there's no, it, all of you will learn at least one thing, I absolutely guarantee, because it's full of things. And I have big plans for that repo. Um, so I will come back here next year and tell you how amazing it is now and how much more awesome it is um, than it is. I haven't set any kind of timer at all and I don't know when I started, sorry. I'm not gonna be that long. Um, yeah, everything's open all the time. Slack isn't 100% open, but I try and get the good stuff from Slack in the open, so we try and get around it that way. Um, I do think it's a very 
kind of flat hierarchy. Mohammed talks about that. Uh, Mohammed obviously talks very eloquently on this subject. Um, I do think we make decisions for the community. If you don't agree with that, please tell me because I want to make sure that we do do that. Um, I think we've got a lot of big strength and diversity. There are so many people here. We've heard loads of clinicians, which is always interesting. We have people who call themselves data scientists. I call myself a data scientist. We have analysts, we have managers, we have, we, you name it. Uh, and we've got experts. You name a thing and there's an expert in it in HSR. And, um, and you know, we've got some really senior talented people um, right in the middle, which is really awesome. Um, we have a lot of friends. Often when you go to conferences, they have, you know, the slide at the beginning where they have loads and loads and loads of logos and it looks really cool. And that's good. I'm not saying that's not good, but I think sometimes it's just kind of strategic partners and funding and it's not really, it's not expressing anything to do with a relationship. Um, I think NHSR is a little different in my opinion to other, um, some other places in that we have, you know, actual friends. So here are some. They've, I don't think they're all in the room right now, but they have been in the room at some point this weekend because I think some of them might have nipped off. Um, but we have loads of friends um, in the true sense of the word. Uh, and of course, our very great friends, NHS Pycon, were just down the corridor. Um, and our very great friends asked, you know, just there, because I've just seen them, and there's people everywhere. Um, right, so what have we done that's good? Um, you know, all the main stuff we do, we, we, we lots of help on Slack, we do training, we do webinars, we've got loads of cool stuff on the GitHub. Um, and it's just our plot lots, I think, is one of our major wins. I say our, I didn't really have anything to do with it. Um, and it's even being promoted by the Making Data account people. The Making Data account people love it, and Sam Riley is a friend of this community, and I think that's really powerful message is that that's that's the kind of reach we got we reach way beyond the geeky which i think in 2018 we were maybe kind of a you know room of geeks and i proudly call myself um, that um but now we've got a big reach now um and i've heard people say this time this conference and i've heard people say through the years that this isn't like other conferences that it's not this is a community in the true sense of the word and you probably some of you are probably getting bored of hearing me say that but i like to remind people because i think that's what makes us special and i don't ever want to lose it so um, that was a false apology for me repeating it because I'm going to keep repeating. Um, so yeah, so I do think NHSR will give back to you. So I've definitely got way more back from the NHSR community than I've given. Um, it's made me better at everything. These are the things it's made me better at. Trainer, program, and data science manager. Feels weird saying that because I'm actually not particularly good at any of those things. Um, I think because you have to be, it's a bit of a, a, a kind of jack of all trades isn't it I think sometimes being an NHS analyst and I think that's another talk really is that it's the number of things you have to master is, is, is very scarily frightening you know frighteningly large um, but it's helped me with all of them um, the other thing I've been thinking about is the people who were here in 2018 some of the people that I met for the first time have now gone into kind of high places they're moving up and get promoted and stuff partly because of the community and partly just because they're awesome in general We've got friends in high places, so we've put people in high places, but we've also made friends in high places. So, yeah, we're going mainstream, and that's the other thing I, I think it's important to remember about NHSR is I think back in 2018 we, were, we weren't mainstream. Our values were, were not shared by the wider system, and I think they are now, or they're trying to be. Um, so I think, you know, I've heard people say things, phrases like the time is now, and, you know, that's, and that's, I think, yeah, that's absolutely right. Right, so what we're doing, I'm, I'm very nearly finished, honestly. Um, do we need a complete rebrand? I've heard this said a couple of times. I'm just going to just throw that at the wall. Mohammed mentioned it. Should we be called NHSR? Because actually there are loads of people who don't work in the NHS here. Should we be called R? Because actually there are people who lose all sorts of languages here as well. I don't know, but I think we need to have a think about it. Um, how do we work better with all the friends that I mentioned before? We've got loads and loads of people all over the place. It's not just NHSR people, loads of other people doing really important stuff. My big thing is having, and there's obviously a lot of work going on this nationally everywhere, a, like a, a, a competency framework, professionalization, a curriculum. I want to be able to bring people in and say, you know, this is, you can end up in one of those 10 boxes and which one do you like to look of? And we'll show you how to get you each, each one. So I think we need to, to map out the journey, map out why you're doing that journey and then give step by step by step by step of how, what to learn. And as far as I know, nobody's really completely, there are people working on that, but no one's grasped that problem. So I want to do that or I want to be part of the people who are doing that. Um, I think we need to build tools for the system. I think we need to build lots of tools that people have been talking about, automating stuff because people waste time with stupid PDFs and all this nonsense. Um, I just want to guess, clear that out of the way, wrap, get it all done. Um, and I think we can do that. Um, I wonder whether we could maybe start trying to develop teams rather than individuals. I think up till now, NHSR has developed, you know, all of you kind of piece by piece by piece. I wonder whether actually it would be even better because people work together. Again, about talking about the value of community, maybe we should teach a team how to work together. 
Um, right, other stuff that I want to kind of think about and promote and think about doing, mentoring, we should be doing much more of this. I'm really going to get that right next year. Um, Way more energy star solutions, as I say, particularly thinking around automation, but not just automation, there are lots of interesting things to do. Open library code, yeah, we've, oh, don't know what happened there. Um, that was like the God agreeing with me. Um, we definitely need to do more of that. Um, so, and we need to just be a better community. We need to have more communication, more engagement. Um, I've called it a shop window and an Argos catalog. It's a bit of a strained metaphor there, basically. I want people to know what's in the community. So what, you know, what is there to, to have? And then once you get in, I want to have a really detailed thing of like these people over here are doing this and these people over here, are, you know, that kind of thing. So you can, so you know what you're getting. Um, so the inspiring message should be ready to be inspired. Um, so none of you are as productive as 20 people can be. Um, no project can be as productive as, as the same piece of code running in 20 other projects. Um, so my job has been increasingly and will increasingly be next year be about promoting teaching and sharing and, and collaboration and that kind of thing that we've been hearing about for the last two days. I'm hoping it's a little bit your job too. It might not be as much your job as it is mine, but I'm hoping it, it, you're going to make that a little part of your job. Um, Mohammed was saying to me earlier, basically, if we got just a little bit of everybody and put it all together, that would be a really, really, really big, awesome thing. So that's what we want to push on. Um, and yes, yeah, so basically because nothing we, we, we can't be as much individually as we, as we could possibly be together. Um, yeah, so Mohammed's I think, going to do, yeah, he's just here, so he's going to come in a sec. I just want to give my thanks, thanks um, to all the aforementioned friends that, were, um, that have been here over the last two days. I want to give thanks to Tom, who has um, been the real social person, because I'm not very good at all that stuff, so he's been doing a lot in the background. Mohammed has organized way too much of this conference on his own, and I've promised myself I'm going to help him much more next year because it's very stressful. Um, all of the audio visual people, it's been, we were saying in the break, it's been absolutely, completely flawless to my knowledge, which is amazing. Often at conferences, you get kind of funny things. So that's awesome. All the conference people, obviously, there's loads and loads and loads of work that goes on organizing things, and it's, yeah, I mean, I, I do like it 1% of it and find it very annoying. Um, so I'm truly grateful to those who've done more of it. Um, obviously, all the speakers, they do get better every year. And I think one year I'm going to have to stop doing papers because they're not going to be good enough. And I do genuinely want to, when you listen to a podcast, they always thank the audience, don't they? And they say, and I always think, well, that's not really real because you could do the podcast without the audience. But I think in this case, it's actually really real because this is a community. So if we didn't have the people who wouldn't be a community. So I think that's, um, that's really real. So I want to thank you all too. That, that's it. I'll hand over Mohammed. <clears throat> <clears throat> So I had a very quick uh, announcement for the the t-shirt raffle. Um, you'll see there's two tables at the back. On the left hand side, there are some R Studio t-shirts that the raffle's for, and and then there are the t-shirts on the right, which are from the L conference that Mohammed nicks a load of. Um, so um, those are just go up and grab them first come first serve. But the R Studio ones, um, we've drawn number three, eleven, thirteen. 16, 17, and 19. Um, I did make a mistake on the t-shirt sizes, so the, the smalls are actually extra smalls, and the extra larges are actually too extra large. So, so there, go grab them. Um, and I will share the code for generating the raffle numbers in the GitHub repository. The Shiny app itself is already in the conference repo, so go have a look at that. I'll share the details on Slack. But over to Mohammed. So can I just, um, so I, in the opening section, I said that one of the most precious gifts anybody can give is their time and attention. So a really, really genuine, humbling thank you, really, for everybody who has given the gift of their time and attention to make the community uh, as amazing as, as it is. And then, and then now, this is the last ever NHSL mug in my lifetime. That, so I've got one left. The, the second last one was given to Chris. So. Anybody who can make a case for why they should have it, providing you've not had it before, I'll be here for the next hour or so, and you can have it. I don't want to post it, it'll just ruin the planet. So you can have it, but you have to get a case for why. Is that okay? Lovely, thanks very much indeed.
Okay, thank you everybody. So that is the end of our session today. Um, so thank you to everyone who's online and thank you to everyone who's here in person. Thanks again to all our speakers. Uh, for everyone who's here, not the online people, you can have a coffee at home. But do go and have a coffee, speak to each other, like build our networks, let's just build our community. Thanks.